everybody. Uh, we got Peter in the chat room. We got Taronda in the chat room. We got Jen in the chat room. I'm doing that thing again with my microphone where it's just a little bit too hot for my tastes. Hi, everybody. Welcome in. Hot. Huh? Oh, see, right there. Hi, hi, hi. When I get to that, that's where it starts to get a little hot in my headphones. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. How's that sound? That sounds all right. I'm going to be able to work with that. I might sound too low. Then what's the whole point of this? What's the whole point of you joining me here every Monday through Friday? High noon, 12 p.m. Central Standard Time, the only standard time that we acknowledge here uh, for the high noon rant. What is the high noon rant? Well, been doing it now for a while. Saying the quiet part out loud since 2021. I just went hot again. Why is my mic so hot? Look in the mirror, baby. It's all you. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, we've been doing this high nude rant now for a couple of years. We do it every day, Monday through Friday. It is a stream of consciousness rant on all the day's current events. It is non-divisive. It is non-politically uh, driven. It is non-partisan. I hate the right. I despise the left. I want to be with you, the good folks of this country who are firmly firmly in the middle, who don't give a shit, who can recognize a weirdo on both sides of the political spectrum. We don't get into that stuff. We do the other stuff. We do the other stuff that, you know, we can all have fun with. Uh, at Hot Topics, we run through it. We do it. We perform the show, as I say, is in a stream of consciousness. That's, uh, that's me sitting here just talking uh, for two hours. Typically, it's a two hour stream. I have no co-host. I don't take any calls. I don't get to take a commercial break. There's no there's no stop downs for traffic or news updates. None of that stuff. It's a stream of consciousness. It's just me alone with my thoughts of the world. And I share them with you. And so many of you have been along for this ride now for two and a half years. And I thank you so much. Hi, Joel. We got Joel. We got April. We got Adam. We got Byron. Peter, as I said. I saw Toronto was in here earlier. All right. People are coming into the room. How do we do this show? Well, it unfolds. Uh, it unfolds in a, a football-like template. Four quarters. We call them quarters. There are four segments that, when performed and then looked at as a whole, create the show, the rant. First quarter, <clears throat> that's a segment that we call antecedently on this day. That's just a fancy way of saying this day in history. I cherry-pick certain things from the course of uh, history things that have maybe shaped our understanding of this day, this time of year. And I talk about them. I cherry pick. I, I don't do all the stuff that happened on this day. That'd be insane. That, how much time you got? Uh, that kind of time. So I just pick some of the ones that I find interesting. That's quarter one. Quarter two is birthdays. Simple. You understand that. Quarter three, deads. This is where we look at people who died on this day throughout history. And we decide whether or not they went to heaven or hell. Yeah, I like that. And it's, it's, you know, look, I like the birthdays too, because you just get to talk about people who you think are cool or people you think suck but the deads you know that's that's a fun one because we get to pretend like we're boss we get to pretend like we're god quarter four is the hot topics current events headlines whatever it is they're screaming about on the cnn's and the foxes and the news maxes and the msnbc's all of that i'll give you that shit uh and then uh and that's it that's it the fourth quarter fourth quarter is just all the hot topics of the day if people are talking about it then i'm gonna bring it up i'm gonna mention it i'm gonna tell you why they're talking about it i'm gonna give you my hot take on it. And then we're going to move on. And again, we don't get politically divisive. I don't care what color hat you wear. I don't care how you voted in November. Save it. Save it. Save it for ruining your family Thanksgiving. We don't need it here. I don't, I'm not interested in it. So that's what we do. Talk radio the way I believe it ought to sound, but the way that you just quite frankly can't get on the radio. Because what do you, what do you mean you don't hate Biden? What, what do you mean you don't hate Trump? I'm not, I'm, well, that one doesn't exist. There is, there, is, there is absolutely no call for people on radio who hate Trump. That's just, you know, radio made their bed and they're very far. When talk radio is concerned, they're very far right. Very far right. And then they, tried, they tried to go far left like a couple of years ago. Like the Air America and all that. And it was so bad. It was just like, ah, oh, this is bad. Hey, at least the right guys are funny sometimes. At least they're, you know. Oh God, had to listen to the uh, had to listen to the Al Franken talk show. That's that's what they were offering over there. So no, thank you. Anyway, this is non-divisive talk radio. 
Uh, this show does run based on your kindnesses, your gratuities. We do. We leave it. We see it right there. We leave it up there. If you're so inclined throughout the course of the show to show your support for this kind of talk, this kind of blabber, then you drop a little something. And every day, the person who dropped the biggest tip, they get to be the executive producer of the show. We got an executive producer today. It's Peter. Peter's been producing all the shows this week. Peter. Peter is the executive producer because, as I say, the biggest tip of the day always gets the executive producer. But we need to I need to shine a light on Barney because Barney does the thing that I love most. Barney Barney does that thing where. Every couple of days, he'll just drop a couple of, you know, a couple of bucks. It's what I mean when I say treat me like I'm your bartender. You're sitting in my bar today. OK, if at the end of today's show, you want to tip a couple of bucks, throw it in there. That'd be great. Now. That is not to say I don't love you bomb droppers. There's a bunch of, it's a bunch of you bomb droppers who come and save the show every month. So I appreciate you. But I did want to shine a little light on Barney. How freaking great he is. I mean, just all the time. Frank is another one. Frank is another one who just does it that way. You know, hey, they look at it like I'm sitting at your bar. So I appreciate you guys. Still love the bomb droppers. But thank you. Thank you to executive producer Peter, who has supported this show endlessly throughout its run. He's the executive producer today, but also, man, we can't overlook, we can't overlook the people like Barney, can't overlook the people like Frank. We can't, I looked, I don't want to name names. You know, I don't like to do that. It's very, some of you people, you drop bombs and you say like, please don't say anything. <laughs> like, I think, what are you in trouble with the wife or something? But man, thank you. That kind of shit means a lot. All right. That's enough of that. What do I got to talk about here? What do I want to talk about here before we begin the actual four quarter show? Oh, I wanted to mention this. So yesterday we introduced a new feature, uh, sudden death overtime. Yeah, I don't know what to call it, but it's the fifth quarter. Maybe we'll call it the fifth quarter. Who knows? Um, yesterday, after the two hour rant on current events, uh, I took a little break and I said, you know what? There's another topic that I really want to get into that I want to talk about, but I want to spread out and I don't want to be you know, trying to wrap it up because I've already been doing two hours. So we did a fifth quarter yesterday where I took a little break because honestly, guys, I know it seems stupid and, but it's not easy to just talk like this for two hours a day. Now that is not to say that it's as difficult as you guys who go out there and dig ditches or you guys who go out there and knock doors or whatever it is that you guys, I'm not saying that. It's not a physical exhaustion, but it is an emotional exhaustion. <laughs> it is just like a drain. So uh, the fifth quarter came about because I really wanted to get into this, this subject. And yesterday's fifth quarter, the inaugural fifth quarter, was the, the conversation about Dan Schneider and Nickelodeon in the 90s. I wanted to talk about that, but I didn't want to just tag it at the end of the show and then be like, oh, I'm so tired. From... So I did a fifth quarter. We're going to do more of that. I just, I just need a little break. I just need a little break in between. I, I need to let the dog out. I need to sit on the porch. I need to have some, I need to shut up. I just need to shut up because you see now we've been on the air for about, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. And I haven't shut up and it's going to go on for another 45 minutes. I'm sorry. I can see the people dropping off now. I understand. But that's what you sign up for when you come to this show. Um, so I think we're going to do more of that. I think we're going to do, I, and I, I also like the idea of the individual subjects because quite frankly, you guys, that one fifth quarter that I did yesterday, that fifth quarter on YouTube has like three times as many downloads as the show itself. So, I mean, there is something to be said about just, you know, concerning one topic and just going off on it. So we're going to try that. I don't know if we're going to try that today. We might. We, there's, there's nothing quite as culturally galvanizing as the one I did yesterday. Because a lot of people watch that. A lot of people grew up in the 90s. But maybe I'll try something different. Like, I'll give you an example. I got this one story. I read this article this morning about Gen X. And, you know, I consider myself the Gen Expert. I am solidly Gen X. And I was reading this article. And it took me away from putting the show together because I just kept screaming at the screen. <laughs> I kept going, what? That's some bullshit. That ain't what. So I'm thinking maybe to, maybe today the fifth quarter will be we go through this list. What it's not a list. I I turned it into a list, but it was an article about uh, all the things. Hold on, let's see how we can word this properly. Uh, the aggravating things that we Gen Xers do, right? It's like from the perspective of a millennial, just taking a big shit on us. Whatever. So I think I'm going to do that as a fifth quarter today. We'll see. 
we'll see how I feel at the end of the show. I might just want to. There you go. Uh, Adam says, I loved having TV viewing assignments with PNK, so I love what you're watching too. Yeah, that's another good thing. You know, that's a great idea. Thank you. I, the whole, see, the whole idea, I was having this conversation with a guy that I'm doing business with yesterday. I was having this conversation about when we create digital content, we can't be creating digital content for everybody. That's that's the broadcasting methodology. It's called the rainbow theory, right? So you imagine a rainbow. There's a whole bunch of different colors in the rainbow. Broadcast entities wanted the entire rainbow. They wanted all the greens and all the yellows and all the oranges. They wanted all of them. That's called broadcasting. They are broadly casting their signal out to as many people as possible. Digital has changed that. We no longer, the rainbow theory says that we no longer try and capture the rainbow. But what we do with digital is we just want all the greens. We just want all the greens. We're not, we're not going to talk about shit that's going to appeal to all the colors of the rainbow. But we'll talk about green until the cows come home. Because the metric is that if you can capture all the greens, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's pretty good. And you should be, that's the that's my bag theory, right? Get your bag. So, so doing more specific subjects as standalones like we did yesterday with the Nick and I, I think we're going to do more of that. I think we're going to do more of that because just for people searching and all that. And I mean, honestly, I have not, I have not been great with this show. This show is a whole bunch of random, you know, topics of the day. So it's nonspecific. It's very general. It's, I could probably get a shit ton more if I just did one. Like if I just did one story for today and just ranted on it for an hour, I would probably get a much bigger audience. But that's no fun. That's, you know, I like to mix it up a little bit. Uh, let's see. T uh, TV viewing. You know, I'll tell you, that you bring up the TV viewing thing. There is a new show that I haven't been talking a lot about because I wanted to wait for a number of episodes before I just go, uh. I mentioned it after the first episode and then I left it alone for the next couple because I wanted to watch the next few and see if it's really something worth talking about. And the key on this is, like, let's take a show, let's take a show like House of Dragon, the, the, the Game of Thrones spinoff. House of Dragon probably has, at this point, thousands of podcasts, thousands of people doing their recap. So you need to look for something that hasn't popped yet. You got to hope that it pops, and then you got to push only that show. And there is a show that I think is possibly, possibly in that category. It's the new HBO Max show, The Regime. I don't know if you guys have been watching this. It's three episodes in. If, if say, Adam and April, if you guys want to sample that show, if you guys want to check, there's only three episodes. If you, it stars Kate Winslet, if you guys want, Martha Plimpton is also in it. Um, if you want to sample that show, The Regime, like I said, three episodes. And then tell me if you guys want to get into it, if we, we think that that's a good show and that we should cover it because there's nobody talking about that show right now. We, we, can, we can establish... Uh, you know, early on the first one. Um, Adam says, so true crime stuff or make Floridia. It's a weekly segment. Well, can't really make Floridia. It's a weekly, weekly segment because James Parker stole that. He stole that and he's running with it. And I applaud him for it. Good for him. And that's again, in the like Floridia, it's like, like, I see what you're saying. Floridians, but everybody does a version of that now. Well, with all due respect to James, James is great. And James, I think does it better than anyone, but it, it, it's, you know, that's sort of such a wide topic. You know, maybe, maybe you just do a segment where I focus on Texans, huh? <laughs> right. Or what if we just did that? Cause that would be, I don't know what we could call that, but, um, but yeah. Okay. So that's that. Uh, April says, okay, yeah, I can watch the regime and I will report back. Uh, yeah, so the regime, I'll just give you a quick little rundown of it. I, I think it's so good. I think last night I just, I binged the the two episodes that I hadn't seen, episode two and episode three, because episode one blew me away. Episode one, I just thought was so interesting and had so much promise. So weird. There's just such weird stuff happening. And then episode two and episode three, man, it is just... You never know what's around the next turn on this show. It's the story. Kate Winslet plays an authoritarian dictator 
the chancellor, the leader of a fictional European country. So think like Estonia or, you know, places like that. And, and don't worry, it's not subtitled. It's Kate Winslet, she does everything in a British accent. Actually, that's not true. Kate Winslet is doing a made up accent because as she said, this is a made up country. So she's just doing this accent that is like a mix of Polish trying to speak English with a bit of a French or Dutch accent. Anyway, it's, it's really interesting. Kate Winslet is slaying it as this authoritarian and don't worry folks this isn't like oh what is what is this like a hollywood liberal authority no 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 she's just wacky she's just nuts <laughs> and she's in charge of everything in this country and just in the last episode she invaded a neighboring country like just like putin and you it's fascinating it's really good it's really good she's crazy she's crazy but she presents well on television and the people kind of love her and she's crazy and she's dangerous. It's, it's really good. The regime. I want you to, cause I would be interested in starting something on that. Cause there is absolutely nothing. And when you get in through the door first on those things, like we could do a Kate Winslet interview. Cause if there's not a thousand people doing these, you know, they're going to try and promote this show and they'll look to see who's doing digital stuff. And that's how some guy you never heard of, gets to interview, you know, whatever. Uh, okay. So that's that with that. Uh, Adam says that's a Stephen Freer show. I'd be down to watch. Yeah. It's Stephen Freer's, but it's also the producers of succession. It's, it's the next project from those people, Frank Rich, uh, who else is involved in it? There's a whole bunch of people like names. It's got a pedigree. Now I did this before I watched it. I, I, I went and I like read some of the reviews and they were really like, they weren't bad, but they were like, they weren't bad. They were like, you know, they weren't universal acclaim. You know, like when you look at a show and you're like, oh, it's got universal acclaim. It was, I think, you know, in the mostly positive reviews. Anyway, I would caution you on that with new shows because I would say, go back and look at Peaky Blinders. Before anybody was talking about Peaky Blinders, look at the reviews of the first season of Peaky Blinders. It was all uh, very mid show. Uh, it's about 67. And then season two, 100% approval rating. Season three, 100% approval rating. It's not that season one sucked. It was just that people weren't watching it and willing to enjoy it because everybody wants to shit on something first. So I would warn you about that regarding the regime. But the regime on HBO, it's very good. I'm thinking about doing something. Uh, cause if it becomes big again, we could, and, uh, I, Adam and, uh, April, you were the two who brought it up. So you would be my co-host on that, <laughs> or you would at least be participants in some way. Cause I need people who are watching. All right. Should we get started? Yeah, let's get started again. I would uh, encourage all of you to drop a little something. If you want help out the show, we are, uh, yeah, it's the middle of the month. It's what I call my broke months. Actually, the, the whole month is broke month, but, you know, if you want to drop a little tip today, that'd be fantastic. Uh, let's get started, shall we? I mean, the stream of consciousness has begun a good 25 minutes ago, so we may as well get the show started. It is the High Noon Rant with me, Pugs Moran. It is the 20th day of April. March. It's the 20th day of March, year of our Lord, 2024. It's the 70, it's the 80th day because we had a leap year. It's the 80th day of the year. There are 286 more of these remaining until the end of the year. So get those New Year's Eve plans started. Uh, Alan Seppenwald, don't know who that is. Yeah. I would go back and I would see what Alan Seppenwall said of like some of the universally acclaimed shows. I, it's it's really funny when you look at the shows that are universally acclaimed and then go back and look at their first their first season and how the first season was reviewed. It's always like, how did something, it aired for eight seasons. Seven of those seasons have 100% approval ratings, except the first season has a 65. That's people. That's people. Don't be, don't ever, ever let reviewers tell you whether or not to watch something trust yourself trailers watch trailers and i know trailers can be deceiving as well but if you can watch a trailer and it's interesting to you that's all you need watch it don't and, and then you know because do what i do i mean i spend i i watch so many things for 20 minutes and then i'm like yep nope i know i know within 20 minutes uh the regime is uh, i give it 
I get it's very promising. That's what I would say. Because three episodes in, you can't say what the first season is. But first episode, I'd give an A. Second episode, I'd give an A. And the third episode, I'd give an A. They're just the story has me. The story has me gripped. Kate Winslet is amazing in this. I'm telling you. She's right now. It's like, oh, yeah, it's that new show. Nobody's buzzing about it. So nobody wants to say how good it is. That's right now where we're at. I would also say, when was the last time HBO put on a show that sucked? Carnival? Maybe that one kind of sucked. They were trying too hard with that. I don't know. But Kate Winslet's going to be two years from now and the Emmy for Best Actress in a Lead. Again, Kate wins. She's gonna win a bunch of these, man. I'm telling you, she's she's such a great actress, and she is playing this super crazy, interesting character. A, a character who has a permanent diviner. You know what a water diviner is? She can't walk into a room without her water diviner telling her what the humidity in the room is because she can't be in a room that doesn't have certain humidity. Oh, she's nuts. She's nuts. Anyway, uh, all right, getting back into it. Uh, well, Adam, Adam, don't defend movie and TV critics. I can't because <laughs> it's all opinion. When I I look at movie and TV guys, I mean, I just don't read them anymore. Stopped about twenty years ago uh, when I got to know a whole bunch of them and realized that they're just people who watch TV and movies like us. That's all. That's all they are. They're like trusting football experts who watch the exact same game as you, who read the exact same newspaper articles, who surf YouTube the exact same way to follow your favorite dance. I just, expertise. I think that's one of the great cons in media. Expertise, that somehow someone is better than you at doing something that we all do, perfectly natural. Uh, Byron says, you think Rachel Maddow is credible? Nothing you say is, okay, okay. We don't need this in the chat room. I love the happy chat room. Stop it, Byron. See, Byron, why were you compelled to go political? Why were you compelled? And you did. I know you don't think you did, but you did. Rachel Maddow is very politically polarizing. <sighs> let's stop these people. You morons. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's put that up. And then let's move forward. No, let's put this up. It's time for Antecedently on this day. A look back at all the events that have helped shape our understanding of this very day in history. We're looking for trends. We're looking for patterns. Anything that's going to give us an edge in the hours to come. Antecedently on this day in 1815, after escaping from Elba, Napoleon enters Paris with a regular army of 140,000 and volunteer force. Uh, let's see. Beginning his 100 days rule. This Look, it only lasted 100 days. Didn't go well for him. But, man, that is still, historically speaking, one of the most baller things anybody has ever done. Dude was imprisoned. <laughs> Dude was put on, a, on an island prison. Now, granted, he lived a pretty noble life there. Uh, but he's put on a prison, and they said, you got to stay here for the rest of your life because you are too much of a troublemaker. And what did he do? He, he immediately turned his guards into his best friends. And then because they were allowed to leave, you know, at night or go home or whatever, those guards went and spread the word throughout the countryside that Napoleon was back and we were going to help him, and you were either going to help him when we reached your town or we were going to burn your town. So he amassed this massive army and just showed up in Paris. Baller move. Antecedently on this day in 1852, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin is published. I never read Uncle Tom's Cabin. I'm um, a white dude. I was never, you know, I went to white schools. It was never one required reading or anything like that. So I'll tell you something, though. Uh... I'm not even sure I know the story of Uncle Tom's Cabin. I should. I should know that story, right? I mean, that would be a, a cultural hole, cultural blind spot, I call them. I don't even know the story. Here's how out of it on, on Uncle Tom's Cabin I am. Until this morning, I thought Harriet Beecher Stowe was black. I thought she was a black lady. I, I think maybe I saw a statue of her. And it was bronze. And I just, she's not, she's a white lady. Harriet Beecher Stowe published Uncle Tom's Cabin on this day. Thought she was, always thought she was a black lady. Uh, born on this day, or not born on this day, antecedently on this day in 1916, Albert Einstein submits his paper, The Foundation of the General Theory of Relativity, which establishes his general theory of relativity to the journal 
I don't know, it's some German word. Anal de la whatever. Uh, e equals M MC squared, right? That's it. That's we. Okay, that's all we know. <laughs> that's all. Not a big, uh, yeah, not a big physics fanboy. Don't, uh, you know, couldn't get through Oppenheimer. I told you, I think it's overrated. It was very boring. It's a good story. But if you really want the story, I'd watch Fat Man and Little Boy. Fat Man and Little Boy, Paul Newman from the 1990s, tells the story for dummies. You know, not dummies, but like normal, normal people. Eh, wonderful performances in Oppenheimer. Too much about his... I didn't care. I don't care. I'm sorry. I, you've got to understand the man and the torture. Eh, that's what books are for. I don't know if that's what a movie is for. On this day in uh, 1987, the Food and Drug Administration approves the anti-AIDS drug AZT. Just in time for Magic Johnson, right? 1987. Well, when was Magic Johnson? Like 90. Did he play on the Dream Team with HIV? Oh. Anyway, AZT, isn't this more commonly referred to as the AIDS cocktail? On this day, AIDS cocktail. Antecedently on this day in 1995, the Japanese cult, not going to even try to pronounce this name. It, it, the first word is, is spelled A-U-M. A-U-M. Well, what is that in Japanese? <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know how to pronounce that in Japanese. What is A-U-M in Japanese? Not a clue. I get, I'm 100% Irish, and I can't pronounce Gaelic names properly. They're all they're all ridiculous. So the first the first word in this cult is A-U-M, and then the second word is uh, S-H-I-N-R-I-K, weird umlaut thing, Y, uh, I don't know. Anyway, this is when they put sarin gas in the subways in Japan. Tokyo, I believe it was. Uh, let's see, carry out a sarin gas attack on this day on the Tokyo subway, killing 13 and wounding over 6,200 people. Oh, this was horrifying. I remember when this happened. I think. Do I remember? Yeah, I remember, I remember when it happened. Man, there's been so many incidents in subways, though. Like, I'm trying to think, like, did I see the video of this? And now I'm thinking of dudes with backpacks. And I'm like, nah, I think that's the 7-7 bombings in England. No, I think that's the, you know, the bombing in, in Boston, the Boston subway. Boston, I don't think, has a subway. I don't even think there was a bombing in Boston. Well, other than, you know, the Patriots Day bombing, which I am not trying to marginalize. I'm just saying it's not a subway bombing. On this day, antecedently in uh, 2010. Oh, for crying out loud. Really? I thought the Japanese cult that dropped sarin gas in the Tokyo subway was a difficult pronunciation. How about this? An Iceland volcano erupted. On this day in 2010, this is the one that uh, was the big one that stopped like all kinds of air travel nationwide because the the smoke or the plume or whatever was all over the air routes. I don't know. Man, I'm telling you, you know, I love Iceland. Iceland is like, God, I would love to like if, I, if they're like, you got six months to live. I'm like, I'm going to Iceland. I'm going to spend the last six months of my life in Iceland. It's just such a nice place. <laughs> the people are beautiful. The people are nice. It's just, it's gorgeous. It's like, you know, there are parts of it where you'd swear you were on the lunar surface. It's like, where am I? Is this still earth? This does not look like earth. Very, very hobbit. Like you imagine this is like where the hobbits are. I love Iceland, but I can't pronounce anything. That's what's stopping me. I would never be able to move there. Cause I can't, the name of this volcano that erupted 10 years ago today. And isn't this interesting? This is why I say we look for rhythms and patterns because we've got another volcano erupting right now, this very moment in Iceland. Not quite to the extent, not quite as much of a, you know, burden as, as this one, but. All right, so the name of this, this uh, I'm, I'm going to have to spell it to you. This is how they spell it. This can't be easy to spell. <laughs> this can't be, and I wouldn't even know how to begin to pronounce it. Here's how it's spelt, this, this volcano. E Y J A F J A L L A J O with an umlaut K U L L. Uh huh. That's it. That's the name of the volcano. Not even going to try it. On this day in 2010, it erupted <clears throat> in Iceland. All right, let's move on. Quarter two. Bottom, bottom, bottom. They say it's their birthday. It's people claiming it's their birthday today. Born on this day in 1922, Carl Reiner. Like Carl Reiner, right? Carl Reiner? I don't know. He's, he's still alive. Is he still alive? 
No, he died. Oh, that's unfortunate. Here I was thinking he's still alive. It's Mel Brooks who's still alive, right? All right. Uh, let's see here. Born on this day, celebrating a birthday today, 1928. How about Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, American television host, producer. He died all the way back in 2003. He was not a sniper in Vietnam. Wasn't even in Vietnam. Stop it, you dummies. See, before Google, this is the kind of shit we all walked around saying. You know, Fred Rogers was great brave sniper. No, he wasn't. So reverend. He was always like just a kind, decent, nice guy. Although, how about this? What if he was still alive and doing show? Like, what if, what if instead of being born on this day in 1928, what if Fred Rogers was born on this day in 1948? Okay. And he's still alive. Are we overturning rocks? Do we have people from the Children's Television Playhouse Network or whatever who produced that thing? Do we have those people stepping forward going, Fred Rogers grabbed my ass? I mean, well, I'm glad he's gone. Glad he's gone. Glad I have the memories of him. Glad his reputation survived whatever was coming because, look, you know I consider myself a good judge of character. I look at Mr. Rogers and I buy 100% in, into that. Like He is very convincing as that character. But there is still a bit of me. I'm Gen X. I have inbred cynicism. There was a part of me that goes, ah, maybe he's just too good at this act. What's he hiding? Nobody can be that pious, that decent, that kindly, that gentle. Fred Rogers, born on this day, 1928. Born on this day in 1931. Here's, here's one of them dudes. Here's, here's a dude who got his bag. I always appreciate the guys who get their bag. And then they go... I put up with some bullshit from some real assholes for a couple of years, and now I got my bag, and I just don't think I need to put up with bullshit from assholes anymore. Happy birthday, Hal Linden. That's right, Barney Miller. What did he do? He did nothing. He was he was Barney Miller. That's it. He was an off-Broadway actor. He's a good actor, too. People are like, that dude's a good actor. Like, he was, like, Broadway was his dream. And then, like, just... On a lark, he got cast on this new TV show, Barney Miller, where he was cast as the titular character, Hal Linden. And for like five or six years, he was a big TV star. Hal Linden was everything. And then Barney Miller went off the air and Hal Linden went, hey, I got a nice size bag. I am out of here. And he went back and he just started doing Broadway. He was offered the role. I don't know, I'm a fan of the show St. Elsewhere, but he was offered the lead role of Dr. Westfall. In, in that went to Ed Flanders, not Ned Flanders, Ed Flanders, the actor. Uh, the role went to Ed Flanders, but it was offered to hell. He turned it down. He was like, I don't want to do that anymore. I just, you know, I like he got his bag. Hal Linden. And guess what? I hope it was a big bad bag because Hal Linden is still alive today. That's right. Hal Linden, born on this day in 1931. Happy birthday, Barney Miller. <sighs> That baseline was cool, right? Cooler baseline. Uh, Seinfeld, bam, 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 bam. or Barney Miller's, boom, 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 boom. That that's a good one. I think I like that one just for sheer heft. Uh, born on this day, celebrating a birthday. Nineteen thirty-seven was the year this dude graced us. He's dead now. That's unfortunate. But how about a hearty, happy, happy birthday to Jerry Reed? Oh, that's right. He got the bandit's blind side, Jerry Reed. Let me tell you something about Jerry Reed, okay? 1970s Jerry Reed, country singer, songwriter, became a, became a movie actor. I dare say that there ain't a more likable individual in the history of Hollywood than Jerry Reed. Jerry Reed came on screen. It's the whole reason he was with Burt. Because Bert needed somebody, because Bert's kind of a D-bag. Honestly, the bandit is kind of a D-bag. He's confident. He's not likable. He's charming in like a charismatic way. But the bandit alone is kind of a D-bag. That's why he had Jerry. He had Jerry, he had Jerry because everybody loved Jerry. And if Jerry could like the bandit, then obviously there's something about the bandit that we're missing. Jerry sees it in him. I loved him. Also, you Southerners, you Southerners really should build statues to this guy. Because let me tell you something. I come from a big northern city. Uh, we, we were snobs. We were rust belt, you know, working class union people. We we, we looked at, uh, you know, the southerners. Uh, you were allowed to be painted as, like, the worst. Yeah. And then Jerry Reed shows up and everybody's dad. Everybody's dad. Jerry Reed's the coolest son of a bitch. We started listening to the country music. Jerry Reed did more for the south 
for people just, you know, busting whatever stereotypes they had about the South. Jerry Reed, man, he was the dude everybody wanted to live next door to. He was the dude that everybody wanted to be best buddies with. And he was the bandits, buddy. Jerry Reed, freaking awesome. Uh, also, born on this day in 1945, Pat Riley. Hey, hey, Pat Riley. Pat Riley, basketball coach, uh, one of the best basketball coaches in the whole world <laughs> of all time ever, I guess. We'll say that. He's good. Uh, I love the portrayal. I don't know how, how real this is, but I do love the portrayal of uh, – uh, uh, hold on. I love the portrayal of Pat Riley. Oh, my goodness. Sorry. Booyakasha. There we go, baby. We got it up. Um, on Winning Time, the HBO show, it's over. I think they're, they're done making new episodes. But um, Winning Time, Winning Time was great. Um, who played him? A Adrian, the guy with the big nose. The guy with the big nose that girls are like, he's so hot. And I'm like, Ugh. If he was like the doorman at your building, you wouldn't think he was hot. But uh, he's a movie star, and I guess he's not fat. So, okay, he's hot. Can't think of his name. Uh, Adam says, don't you call Phil Jackson overrated? Because I'd call Pat Riley overrated, too. I, I call Phil Jackson extraordinarily overrated. Absolutely. <laughs> Phil Jackson walked into... Yeah, Phil Jackson's very overrated. And I, and I got no hate for him either. It's not like, ah, oh, I hear he's a dick. No, nothing like that. It's just, you know, look at what he did. It's like he had Shaq and Kobe and he had Jordan Pippen and Rodman. I, if you can't win with those teams, I, it's just always been my thought. Um, I don't feel the same about Pat Riley because of Pat Riley in the 80s, because of those Lakers teams in the 80s. You, you could argue that he's overrated because of the accomplishments in Miami and even, even to some extent in New York. But I think that what he did – when he was, he was a dude, he was a TV play-by-play -play guy who just became a coach. And he's yeah, pretty good. I mean, I don't know. I like the Pat Riley story. Broken down player, gamer player, you know, never a star, but someone everybody wanted on their bench because he could come off and he would give you blood, sweat, and tears. That's who Pat Riley, the player, was. And the Lakers put him next to Chick Hearn. You know, try him out as a color guy for the for the Laker broadcast back in the late 70s, early 80s. And all of a sudden, he's the manager or he's the coach. It's a good story. Uh, next one here. Let's talk about this. All right. Jeff Brabham is celebrating a birthday today. Jeff Brabham. Uh, you, you, that, only a few of you know who Jack Brabham is. Of course, Jack Brabham is the son of Black Jack Brabham. Uh, Formula One great. Jeff Brabham spent some time in Formula One. Jeff Brabham is a race car driver. Jeff Brabham is one of the most accomplished race car drivers in the world. Dominates the sports car scene. Dominated the GTP scene. Uh, raced at Indy a bunch of times. But, you know, he's more of a GTP guy. Which is interesting because his dad, Sir Jack Brabham, was like one of the great Formula One drivers of the 1960s, 50s, and 60s. And, you know, didn't we say this the other day about uh, Jerry Rice's kid, Brendan Rice? I said, why, why would Brendan Rice want to become a wide receiver, right? He's just going to live in his dad's shadow. Well, Jeff Brabham, <clears throat> for the bulk of his career, uh, avoided Formula One because his dad was a legend. He's like, you know, it's just it's never going to be good for me. Now, why am I going on and on about Jeff Brabham? Because Jeff Brabham was my driver. That's right. I tell, I tell stories all the time about my uncle, about my, how my uncle built one of the most successful race cars in the history of professional auto racing, the Nissan 83 that dominated the IMSA GTP tournaments of the late 80s and early 90s. He used to travel around the country to go to these races. Here, let me show you this car. Let me show you Jeff Brabham's car. This was the car of my youth, man. It was in the Smithsonian for like 10 years, this car, because it's the winningest race car in the history of American motorsports. Um... It's not in the Smithsonian anymore. I don't know. Anyway, here, watch this. I'll show you Jeff Brown. Motorsports Association season. Appeared destined yes. to repeat a refrain echoed through a camp first in car. Making it its is. first 1988 appearance, the Nissan. Brake problems dropped the Nissan. Oh, the oh, races oh. at Sebring, Florida. The Nissan team was a few hundred miles north in cold, rainy Georgia. Preparing to rewrite the record books. After three years of private frustration and public ridicule, this team was about to turn. All right. I just at this point want to point out that's my uncle. <laughs> that's my uncle. Hey, mom, look, it's Joey. That's that's my uncle, the guy with the paper towels who's cleaning off the windshield. He designed the engine for this car. This was his car. This is why I went to all the races. 
This is why I followed this around. This is why I say Jeff Brabham is my guy. He was cool. Uh, here, oh, you don't believe me? Oh, Pugs, you're just telling stories. How about this? Look at this. I even got pictures. Boom. Look at this. This is me with Jeff Brabham's car. This is probably 1988, 1989, when we were just dominating, kicking the shit out of Porsche and Jaguar at every race, the Nissan 83. Ah, uh, what else we got here? Yeah, the good pictures. Oh yeah, there's my there's my uncle and Mario Andretti. My, my uncle's wearing the fire suit. I'm like just taking a picture of him. There you go. Jeff Brabham celebrating a birthday today. The reason that I am into auto racing to the degree that I still am because of those crazy 80 days of uh, 80s days of going to races every summer, driving to driving to Lime Rock, driving to Mid Ohio, camping out at Elkhart Lake, waking up with a bear. On the hood of the car. Yeah, I've told that story before. We were at the racetrack in Wisconsin and we fell asleep in our car. We went to a campground because we didn't have, we were teenagers. We didn't have enough for a hotel. So we just slept in this car. And this car had T-tops. <laughs> and it was a nice Wisconsin summer night. So we had the T-tops open. And uh, we just fell asleep in the car. We, that's where we were going to sleep. All right, I'll sleep here. You sleep there. We were sleeping in the car. And we had Burger King the night before. And we had just mogged on some Burger King. And we had thrown the Burger King bags, of course, in the back seat of the car. Woke up about 7 o'clock in the morning with people screaming. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Like, we hear this. And I'm like, what's going on? And we wake up. And I look through the windshield of the car. And with the T-tops open, there is a bear climbing on the hood of the car. At that point, a ranger came out with a fire hose and just <laughs> blew that bear off the car. Got a $150 fine. <laughs> the rangers fined us. We were almost mauled by a bear. But as they said, maybe you weren't mauled, but somebody else around you could have been mauled. You got to put them Burger King bags in the trash, in the sealed trash, the airtight trash. That's why we have airtight trash at this campground, because bears are out here. That was us. That was my mistake. Uh, all right. Happy birthday, Jeff Brabham. Cool guy, too. His, his wife was an international jet ski champion. I don't know if that means anything. Uh, born on this day in 1957, how about Spike Lee? American actor, American director, Spike Lee. I like Spike Lee movies. I can't, I, well, I won't do a Spike Lee draft because, you know, I don't like all Spike Lee movies. Some of them I think are just a little bit too, nope, not for me. Uh, but uh, I like Jungle Boogie. I like that. I like, I love, I <clears throat> Hey, Sal, how come there ain't no brothers on your wall? I love Do Your Right Thing, Do the Right Thing. I love Do the Right Thing with a young Gus Fring. As I showed that to my son. My son's into like Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul and he likes Gus Fring. So I pulled up a clip from Do the Right Thing with like a 20-year-old Giancarlo Esposito <laughs> where he has that line. Hey, Sal, how come I ain't no brothers on this wall? Actually, is that him or is that? That might be Spike. I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, point is, Spike Lee's having a birthday today. Kathy Ireland is having a birthday today. Kathy Ireland was born on this day in 1963. Spike was born in 1957, by the way. I'm not sure I said that. Kathy Ireland, born on this day in 1963. Who hot damn. Fun fact about Kathy Ireland, not Irish. Yeah, she's not Irish. She got the name, but she's not what she is. She's she's actually English. Um, not, she's not from England, but her ethnicity. Uh, dead on this, or born on this day in 1976. Uh, dead in 2017. Shockingly dead in 2017. This is, um, th this is an interesting guy because, you know, Jimi Hendrix, right? Jimmy, Jimi Hendrix, oh, Jim Morrison, you know, Kurt Cobain, you know, all of these people, they died at the height of their fame and were extraordinarily important to a very specific demographic of people, people who are into that stuff in the moment. So Chester Bennington is celebrating a birthday today. Chester Bennington, of course, uh, killed himself. He's Lincoln Park, killed himself back in 2017. And I've often wondered, because Linkin Park was so big for, for that generation of kid, that generation. I mean, how come Chester Bennington isn't like Kurt Cobain? How come, Ch and maybe, maybe it's just simply because Linkin Park wasn't Nirvana. I, I don't know. I think that's a very, you know, that depends. Uh, 
there was no one. I look, I, I personally think Nirvana is better than Lincoln Park, but that's just because of my own personal likes and dislikes, and we're all different. It's relative. Um, oh, hold on. James wants me to do 4:30 today. Uh, I suppose so. That means I gotta run around. That's gonna change some things. Okay. Never mind. Uh, James, I'll be on WBAP today. WBAP, ba bap bap bap, uh, with James doing my Hollywood thing. I do Hollywood because I'm not going to talk anything else on BAP. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to be on record. <laughs> as, you know, I just I love James. I love talk radio. And as long as they offer me an opportunity to do something that I'm comfortable with, I will every time say absolutely. That's a good show too, by the way. James is uh, James is having fun over there. I'm a daily listener to a point. You know what I mean? To a point. <laughs> to a point. I don't like politically divisive talk. Although I would like to point out that my relationship with James Parker should be something that the rest of you look at and go, how can two people who, you know, are completely different when it comes to the voting booth and... I say we're completely different because although he claims to be an independent, I, he, you know, he, oh, he always seems to vote or a libertarian. He claims uh, he always seems to caucus with a, with, you know, a group that I won't. And I don't want to caucus with the Democrats either. So, you know, I'm kind of out there. So how is it that he and I have remained so close? Uh, because uh, he doesn't define himself by that shit. And I don't define him by that. And he doesn't define me by my things that he disagrees with me with, you know, what we define ourselves by our mutual, admiration for one another's talents, kindnesses, and a shared history of 20 years of going through this crazy world. So that should be a lesson to the rest of you. The ones who can't even get along with your uncle at Thanksgiving, you know, just fucking don't talk about that. We don't talk about that shit. We don't, we don't need to. We're very respectful of one another. Uh, okay. So where am I? Chester Bennington. I was talking about him. So he's, uh, he died and it's his birthday. And I'm wondering why he's not quite as heralded as uh as, as some of the other people rock stars who in their peak died or took their own lives um but i'll say this um my son who's 14 years old has discovered <laughs> he he discovered he discovered lincoln park not through me just through his own musical exploration and and he likes this he loves the stuff that lincoln park did with jay-z he thinks that's all really cool and I'm like, yeah, no, Lincoln Park, they were legit, kiddo. I, uh, you know, not exactly my generation, but they they did some really interesting things and they sold a lot of records. They were very popular. And so it's interesting that he has sort of rediscovered Chester Bennington. But he was kind of forgotten, right? Like there was there wasn't there aren't posters of Chester Bennington in in teenagers' rooms the way there are posters of Kurt Cobain. Uh, I don't know. Talented guy, sad story. Uh also born on this day, year of our Lord, 20. Oh, three, 2003. How about Cooper Hoffman? Cooper Hoffman is a very interesting, interesting actor. Um, Cooper Hoffman is uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's son. And uh, maybe you saw him in last year's Paul Thomas Anderson film, uh, Licorice Pizza, right? He's very good. It was his first role. And, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson worked with Philip Seymour Hoffman a lot. Like as a director, Philip Seymour Hoffman was kind of Paul Thomas Anderson's go-to guy for a lot of great roles. And uh, it's neat that Paul Thomas Anderson has kind of taken to Cooper Hoffman as well and made him star his first thing they ever did, starred in, uh, starred in that licorice pizza. He's good. I root for him. I, uh, I root for him. I, wor I root for Michael Gandolfini, who is James Gandolfini's son, who's you know also out there. Let me just tell you, it's, uh, it's the cult of those of us who lost our fathers very early. That's it's the cult. <laughs> We all, we all kind of have that in common. All right, there you go. That's going to be birthdays. Now let's move on to the deads. These are the people who have died on this day. This is quarter three. These are the people who have died. Uh, we're going to open up their resume. We're going to decide whether or not, you know, they go to heaven or hell. Uh, not a great, not, not a really great 
day for deads, which is probably a great day. It just means that this is a day when not a lot of notable people are known to have passed away. Uh, dead on this day in 1994, newspaper man and writer and just curmudgeon, uh, Louis Grizzard. Uh, he's going to hell. Louis Grizzard was a piece of shit when he was the editor of the Chicago Sun-Times sports section. He would go on to great fame, uh, you know, a bunch of books. He would be on The Tonight Show all the time. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he was... Uh, there was, he's a good old boy from Georgia who had a certain perspective that I don't think would really, uh, you know, work in mainstream media today. He fired all the black guys who were writing for the Chicago Sun Times. <laughs> Just walked in and went, "I don't think the black perspective is something." And I'm, you know, in Chicago, really? You don't think so? Okay. But anyway, I think he also married Annie Potts. I think he was also married to Annie Potts. Anyway, he's a bad guy. He's a dick. He's a total dick. Funny writer, terrific writer, separate the art from the artist, but Louis Grizzard was a dick. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? David Rockefeller. Well, we're just going to preemptively put anybody with the last name Rockefeller in hell because there is absolutely no way you're going to be born with that name given all that comes with it. Spend how many years on this planet and then go to heaven. That is not, uh, not going to happen. This, your experience in this world, in this time with the last name Rockefeller, is your heaven. Now go burn in hell forever. Uh, dead on this day in 2020, this man is getting preemptively put in heaven. How do you, how do you not put the gambler in heaven? Kenny Rogers, dead on this day, 2020, 2020. Uh, born in 1938, Kenny Rogers. Uh, hey, hey, you guys ever have Kenny Rogers chicken? Pretty good. Well, maybe. Wait, is it here? In, I don't think it was here in Texas. Was I think it was primarily in the South, although there was a New York location made famous by uh, Seinfeld. But uh, we didn't have like Kenny Rogers roasters in Chicago or in the Midwest. But I was in Nashville once and I uh, we stopped at Kenny Rogers and we ate some Kenny Rogers chicken. And I remember thinking, this, this is look, objectively, this is good chicken. This is. Uh, let's see. Kenny Rogers. How great was he? A Dallas kid, right? Was he a Dallas kid? Is he from something? He's got some tie to Dallas. His first band, the, the fifth edition or something, the new edition, the foot. No, couldn't have been new edition. Fifth edition. Maybe. I don't know. Had some tie to Dallas. Maybe he's from here. I don't know. But anyway, I don't have to go all that far into Kenny Rogers. Cause I preemptively put him into heaven. There you go. A gambler. Uh, Byron says there was a Kenny Rogers in Mesquite and it was wonderful. It, they really were pretty good, right? <laughs> they were, I mean, I, I, I put them like, if you're wondering, well, what was it? it? It's sort of like in between a Kentucky fried chicken and a Boston market. Like just imagine something in between that. Kenny Rogers was good. Uh, okay. That's going to do it. That's the first three quarters of the show. We'd like to thank today's executive producers, Peter and our associate producer, the great Barney, who thank you so much, Barney. We appreciate it. Every little bit helps. You guys can tip any point during the show. It's how we continue to do it. It's how we've been doing this show for two and a half years. All right, let's continue on. Next couple of days might be time to tip. We won't go hard next week, but, uh, you know, we'll take next week off. But if you wanted to help out this week, would be great. All right, moving on. Let's talk about all the things that are happening today. This is where we go through all the hot topics, the current events, whatever it is that people are buzzing about. And I give you a little bit of a hot take on it, and then we move on. Again, non-divisive, non-politically partisan. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. First story. This was the thing that jumped out at me today. This is the first thing I saw in the news when I woke up I wake up, I put the news on I make my coffee. I take the dog for a walk. I come back in. I don't pay attention to any news for about a good 30 minutes after I wake up. Uh, our water's under attack. What is this? Have you seen this? The feds are warning of a, of a possible attack on our water supply. What are we living in a video game now? What what do you mean an attack on our water supply? Um, so Chinese hackers, they're saying Chinese hackers. And it, well, here, I'll read it to you because one of them is so funny. One of the names of this group is so funny. It's like, Jesus Christ, are we just all in a Marvel film now? U.S. warns, uh, warns of cyber attack against our water systems throughout the nation. Okay, come on, come on, scroll down. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, feds are warning states to be on guard for cyber attacks against water systems, citing ongoing threats from hackers linked to the governments of Iran and China. Disabling cyber attacks are striking water and white and wastewater systems throughout the United States. That's a quote from the government. Can I read that quote again? Disabling cyber attacks are striking water and wastewater systems throughout the United States. Disabling cyber attacks are striking. So there are currently, like this isn't like, hey, we think they might come for our what? So this is an ongoing thing. And they're saying, look, it's getting worse. Okay, maybe, you know, some alarm should have been sounded earlier than just, you know, now. Going, that's been happening. Oh, yeah, man. People in Scranton, they've been drinking piss water for a week. Yeah. Disabling cyber attacks are striking water and wastewater systems throughout the United States. Uh, let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. These attacks have the potential dis to disrupt the critical lifeline of clean and safe drinking water, as well as impose significant costs on affected communities. <laughs> Okay, so here, this is where I, I get like, come on, man. All right, so what the fuck? Are we in a Marvel film? Is everything? Uh, the names of the groups, okay? So hackers affiliated with the Iranian government's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps have attacked drinking water systems while a People's Republic of China state-sponsored hacker group, Volt Typhoon has compromised information technology of drinking water and other critical infrastructures from coast to coast. Volt Typhoon. This this is the enemy now. We have to all be afraid of. Oh, uh, it's like it's like what's the what's the one in what's the one in the DC and what's the one in the Marvel? What are the bad guys called? Just so the water system is an especially vulnerable part of the United States infrastructure fraught with weak controls, insufficient funding and staffing shortages. Uh, in late November, an Iranian-backed hacking group attacked Israeli-made digital controls commonly used in the water and wastewater industries in the U.S. This affected multiple organizations across several states. Drinking water and wastewater systems are an attractive target for cyber attacks because they are a lifeline critical infrastructure sector, but often lack the resources and technical capacity to to adopt rigorous cybersecurity measures. Um, yeah, so... That's what we do here in this country. We have no protections against our water because budgets, because, oh, well, it would cost us an extra, you know, five grand a month if we were to have some dude stay here 24 hours and watch the water or whatever. I know I'm making a very reductive and dumbed down example, but that's what it is. We have nothing in our budgets for the shit that we really need. So we got piss water. We got the Chinese fucking with everything. All because of tax cuts, all because of, you know, Jeff Bezos needs to get that 15th yacht. That's why we don't have this shit. Uh, we, our water supply is vulnerable in this country because we can't afford. We're the wealthiest fucking nation on the planet. We can afford to protect our water supply. We choose not to protect our water supply. So what's going to happen? Something terrible. We will eventually one day decide to protect our water supply, but it will become you know, something we have to do because we've lost like 8,000 residents of some suburb in Ohio because some terrorist found a way to get through our security. Whatever security that is. Uh, also trending today, Cuba. Cuba is trending. Cuba gonna fall, y'all. Cuba looks like Cuba is gonna fall. And oh my God, what kind of opportunities is that gonna be for the rest of us? My buddy Aaron Sockwell, he's got a bunch of land that the communists owe him over there. Maybe his family go back and claim their land. That'd be great. He doesn't want to move there. I will. I'll go handle it for you. I'll go live on the beach over there. What do I got? I got nothing. I can live stream from Cuba. Yeah, man, Cuba's in, having troubles. Haiti, let's forget about Haiti for a minute. Cuba's closer. Not only that, Cuba's more desirable. And yeah, I'm calling it Cuba because that's fun. And uh, I was talking about Cuba a few years ago with my kid. <laughs> we were like talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis, and I started calling it Cuba. And he got he started getting irritated. He's like, "Why are you pronouncing it that way?" I'm like, "Because that's how you pronounce it, Cuba." So now I always call it Cuba because I know if he hears it, it'll irritate him, and that's fun for me. So Cuba, Cuba, they got no power, they got no food, they got no nothing. They're rationing. They're doing rolling blackouts. The Communist Party is falling apart. We are days away. 
from the mafia being able to effortlessly move back into Cuba and take over their gambling resorts. And now, man, I'm telling, could you imagine what a free Cuba, what a capitalistic Cuba would be like over the next 20 years? It'd be fun. It'd be fun. You realize Vegas would not have become Vegas had Cuba not fallen to the communists because Cuba right off the coast of Miami is where all the gambling was. That's why the mob was so involved down there. And then they got pushed out. Cuba, Cuba's on their knees. Uh, goon squad. That's the word that's trending now for these Mississippi cops. We talked a little bit about them yesterday. These were a band of cops in Mississippi who tortured a uh, black dude, a uh, black dude who was, who they thought was sleeping with a white woman. That's part of it. That's why they were so angry at him. Uh, one of them got 20 years yesterday. The other one got 16. The, there's, there's a couple more. The other one's I think 18 and well, no, wait, one of them hasn't been sentenced yet. Dateline Jackson, Mississippi, shipper, shipper. Why not? Who cares? I don't have to pronounce Mississippi, right? Nobody cares about that state. Michael Corey Jenkins and Eddie Terrell Parker sat on the front row of a packed courtroom Tuesday and watched as federal judge handed down years long sentences to two of the former white Mississippi law enforcement officers who tortured the two black men last year in a brutal attack that began on the basis of race. And he's sleeping with a white woman. Hunter Elward, 31, was sentenced to 20 years in prison, while Jefferson Middleton, the 46-year-old leader of the so-called goon squad that abused the men, was giving a 17.5-year prison sentence. Why is the difference? Because the guy who got 20 is the idiot who tried to play Russian roulette, and they all agreed that there would be no bullet, but he forgot to take the bullet out like he didn't check, and he played Russian roulette with the dude, and he blew his cheek and tongue off. Ugh. That guy got 20. And the other guy who was just like, you better make sure there's no bullet in there. That guy got 17 and a half because he tried, I guess. Um, before sentencing Edwards and Middleton separately, uh, U.S. Judge Tom Lee called the form. Pop-ups, pop-ups, pop-ups. Don't like pop-ups. Pop-ups make it so we can't read the story. Uh, the terror began on January 20. I don't need to go into the details. Anyway, I think we're listening to... Here's what we're looking at. They're all going to get around 20 years. There you go. All going to get around 20 years. And I, I hope it's more. I, I I mean, I hope it's more because they are cops. I, I like, you know, a regular dude that does this, you know, we need to put him away for a period of time. But I do hope that there is more of a punishment because of these people and the fact that they carried a badge. I, I think you do something like this when you carry a badge, you are violating the trust that we give you. When you have that badge, and what is that trust? Well, the trust says, if we're playing the game, we give you a badge. That means you tell us to do something, and we're going to do it. We're going to follow along. We're going we're gonna to listen. We're going to trust that you are doing your duty to serve and protect. When you violate that as a police officer, man, I think that that should, and it's in the course of a criminal act, I think that needs to compound the charge. I think there needs to be more of a consideration for the fact that you betrayed the entire community by turning out to be a fucking criminal yourself. Goom Squad, trending. Uh, Bernie Moreno is trending. We were talking about Bernie Moreno last week. He's the Ohio Republican uh, uh, Trump guy. Trump endorsed him. He, he's running for Senate there. He's trying to knock off old Sherrod Brown. Sherrod Brown's hysterical. He's a senator. He looks like he always needs a shower. He's uh, Sherrod Brown always looks like he needs a shower and he needs a haircut. He's just like, you know, it's, he's like a couple days. Sherrod Brown has hair that says, I'm two days away from a haircut. And 10 days past should have gotten him a haircut. So I'm getting a haircut on Friday. He always looks like that. I know, I know, it's a mess. I'm getting a haircut on Friday. He's that guy. You know what else he looks like? He looks like a guy who's going through a divorce and living out of a suitcase. He has the absolute worst suits. Sherrod Brown. That's the guy, very popular in Ohio. I mean, he's going to get reelected. This dude, Bertie Moreno, is another one of these dead-in-the-water candidates that's coming out of the Republican primary. See, here's the thing. Bernie Moreno, we talked about him last week. He uh, he had an adult friend finders. He's accused of having an adult friend finders account where he was seeking men for men. Right. So that's kind of crazy because he's very anti-gay and he's very all this stuff. Um, but a lot of these people are, you know, that's the shame of their reality. They can't handle because of the cultural influences, whether it be evangelical Christian, you know, upbringing or whatever it is. Uh, you know, they can't handle the shame of who they are, which is a gay dude, you know, they can't be. so they, they, they overcompensate in the other direction and they become all gays must die. You know, they become that. 
Anybody who really hates gays and is really going hard against the gays, I'm always like, you're gay, aren't you? You're gay and your parents are still alive. That's what's happening. Your dad has always looked at you in a way that said, I think this kid might be. And now you got to overcompensate because they're still alive. Anyway, that's kind of what this guy did. He used to be pro-gay agenda. He used to be. And then, you know, he got into a little MAGA thing and now he's anti-gay. So as a way to take him down, they found an adult friend finders <laughs> thing from like five years ago or whatever where he's like, I'm looking for dudes to hook up with. Now, here's the thing. They were able to knock that down almost immediately because they said, you know what? This was a joke among car dealers because he's a car dealer, which, you know, if you're asking me, that should be reason one not to vote for him for politics. But OK, you fucking people don't seem to take any context clues into account when you're casting your votes. Car dealer. Uh. So they're saying, oh no, this was just a prank. This was just a this was just a prank where a guy at the car dealership, you know, a guy that was making fun of them, you know, they got they were razzing each other. He made this adult friend finder gay ad with his name on it. And I'll tell you, man, a lot of people, like especially people on the left, people on the left are like, oh, a likely story. Now here's the thing. The account was never activated. Nobody ever sent anything to it. It was just made and placed there like so much space junk floating around in cyberspace. He never checked it. It was made from his email. But that's part of the prank. They were like, yeah, we did it from his email. We wanted, we wanted, we were screwing with him. We, we, we made him a gate. And again, I tell you, the left and all these people who are somehow just across the board against whatever this guy stands for. And, you know, I probably am too. He doesn't seem like a great guy. He's a car dealer after all. Um, they're saying that's. Yeah, a prank. Sure. Dude, I'm here to tell you, I totally buy that. I totally buy that that's a prank. A bunch of car dealers? You don't think that a bunch of car dealers, when they're fucking with each other, don't go, you're gay. You know, you don't think that that's still kind of the way that they interact with each other, that kind of sophomoric locker room frat boy kind of thing. And the height of comedy in that world is to, I'm making a profile on a gay dating site. You know, I mean, I could totally see that being a reality. I could totally see that. Anyway, that story didn't stick. He won. He won the Republican primary yesterday in Ohio. So he's going to suit up and he's going to take on and get absolutely destroyed by Sherrod Brown. <laughs> he's, Sherrod Brown's a juggernaut. They like him there. I think he's trailing 20 points or something. They were talking about that already, but whatever, that'll happen. See, this is the this is the problem that I always talk to my Republican friends about. Again, I'm neither Republican or Democrat. But I always talk to my Republican friends about this, man. You keep running in generals, these dudes who dominate in in the in the primaries, right? So you so you get the most extreme guy coming out of the primary system most extreme guy. And then that's who you're running in the general election. And that extreme guy does not do nearly as well in the general as he does being super extreme in the primary. It's a problem. It's a problem they got to try and figure out. I would suggest just, you know, don't be so extreme. Just kind of be cool. Just try and be cool. Just try and be like, yeah, I, I could see that, but we ain't doing that. Like you don't have to be overly extreme. Like instead of going, yeah, it's, I understand your point here, but no, I don't think we're going to be doing that. Instead of that, like, their thing is, ah, I don't think we're going to be doing that. And you know what? Uh, you're the devil and you're going to hell and you're, you know, it's all extreme. <laughs> it's all like way too much. And that doesn't play in the general. And I think that's, that's going to be a problem. That has been a problem. Well, who am I to say this? Right. Who are you to say this? Well, I just watched the last couple of national elections where in generals, people who dominated in primaries doing extreme MAGA type rhetoric, they get their asses kicked. They get their ass kicked from coast to coast, especially at the, in the senators' uh, races. And that's what this is. This is a senatorial race. It's different than a congressional race. A congressional race is pretty much just that little district. A Senate race is statewide. So I don't know. But uh, as far as the, you know, he's a closet gay thing. Okay, let's put that to bed. Because I find that totally believable that some other car dealer was fucking with him. <laughs> That's totally believable. I feel like maybe I would have done something like that back in the day. Back when being gay was funny. It's not funny anymore, apparently. Not apparently. It's not funny anymore. Which is, it's, it's just a thing. Being gay now should be no funnier than being a redhead. Which is hysterical. So that was a bad example. Uh, let's see here. Moving on. That's how you do a potentially political story while 
trying not to be divisive. Uh, here's another one we'll get into. Stormy Daniels, she's got a new documentary on Peacock. She's saying that she's lived her life for the past five years in total and abject fear. She's, she thinks Trump's going to try and kill her. And uh, I would say Trump ain't got the yeah. cash for that, babe. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> he, ain't, he ain't paying anybody to kill nobody. He's got uh, more important bills. Uh, so the new documentary on Peacock, you know, last night I'm sitting there on the couch watching TV and I'm like, okay, Stormy Daniels documentary on Peacock. And, uh, just as quick as I picked up the remote, I went, yeah, no, yeah. fuck that. I'm not yeah. even remotely interested yeah. in that. Yeah. I'm not, I don't need, I, I think I have an understanding of what happened. All right. You want to hear my understanding of what happened? And this is going to be my totally unvarnished thing of what happened. Trump is a rich guy. He's a big player, big baller. He's out there at some golf resort. He's out there at some golf tournament. Everybody's taking pictures with him. There's a bunch of porn stars and all the sketchy ass people that show up to these kinds of things. They are, you know, your rando, your rando ABC sitcom star with some guy who quarterbacked the Jets 20 years ago. You know, it's just this mix of weird celebrities. And I've been to those things. I've hung out at those things. Uh, and you know, there's always like, you know, bars afterwards and people sitting around and there's private VIP tents where everybody mingles and all that kind of stuff. So here's what happened. Trump saw a hot porn star and he decided he wanted to bang her because he's, you know, he's a dude who likes banging chicks. That's his thing. Who amongst you is going to throw the first stone? You know, I mean, that's his thing. Now you might say that, well, he was married and his wife was pregnant and that's all bad. Whatever. What? Okay. I don't care. I've already, I already know what kind of man he is. I already know what kind of man I think he is. So all that shit is just not important. So he bangs her. He screws her. They have sex. They have sex. He's like, that's a hot chick. And you know what? Before I go to sleep tonight, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to bang her. And so he does. He bangs her. Is that, is it sleazy? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, depending on who you are and what your background is and your upbringing and your moral code and all that, maybe a little sleazy. Um. But what about her? <laughs> I mean, what is she doing? What, what, is, what is Stormy Daniels doing? And, and stop it with, oh, now you're victim blaming. She's not a victim. She's not a, well, she might be a victim if he tries to kill her, but she, was, she wasn't victimized here. This wasn't sexual assault. She was completely down to F. She was into it. And she's a porn star. She's probably pretty promiscuous. No judgment. I think promiscuous women, if they own it and they're loud and they're proud and they say this, is, I think that's wonderful. Don't be promiscuous and then judge others, though. That's something that I don't really. You're going to be promiscuous. I have two friends that I see on Facebook. Two friends. Two friends on Facebook who are all good Christians, mo Christian moms now. And they're, they're all about, I support the woman's not. They're all anti abortion, right? They're all like, overturn Rovers. Both of these girls had abortions in high school. Both of these girls. So, you know, those are the kinds of things I get mad at. Stormy Daniels was a girl who came from probably pretty meager beginnings. There's not a lot of silver, silver spoon porn stars. She probably came from meager beginnings. She very early on realized that she was an attractive woman and that could be an asset to her in gaining what she wants in this world. It's a choice that a lot of women make. And this is why, I, you know, I have this conversation with adult film stars all the time when I used to interview them. It's their life choice. They saw the opportunities that they had and there weren't many. You know, their, their uncle didn't work at, you know, Shearson brothers. You know, there was no opportunity. Their aunt isn't on the board of Yale university. You know, so, so in order to make it in life, you have to make certain choices. And when a poor rando rural hot chick gets to a certain age, you know, she ain't going to college. And now well, look, there's an opportunity only fans for, for the ones today. But years ago with Stormy Daniels, it was porn. It was go do porn. Uh, fine, let everybody in the country look down their nose at him. Whatever, I get it. You made a choice. You, ma you made a choice because it was the only way for you to get out of what you were doing, try and build something for yourself. So that's what she did. She had sex with Donald Trump. And she got paid off to have sex with Donald Trump. And that that's the scandal. The scandal is that he cheated on his wife and he paid off a porn star. There's all kinds of, there's nothing like really bad about it. There's nothing like that I didn't think happened to half a dozen times, right? I mean, I imagine he's got a bunch of these girls out there. We found out that he does. He's Donald Trump. He was a big swinging dick for 20 years, man. You don't think he was getting laid every night? They probably screwed a lot of sketchier people than Stormy Daniels.
But I don't see Stormy Daniels is not a victim. She's not a victim. She's a grown woman. She was a sexy woman. She was a sex pot who used her sex, her sex ability to get what she wanted. God love her. Strong woman. That's her. She made her choices based on her life experiences and her evaluation of what the next 10 years of her life was going to be. She's not a victim. <laughs> she saw a gross, fat, old, rich guy and went, ah, there's a chance for me here. I mean, I don't know what she was thinking. Was she thinking that he would leave his wife? She couldn't be. She's smarter than that. I've seen enough interviews with her. She's not dumb. She knows that he wasn't going to dump his pregnant wife, Milani. So it was just a one night thing. It was just, Stormy Daniels wasn't thinking that he was going to be my boyfriend. No, she just hooked up with this guy because he's so hot, right? I mean, is that it? She saw him and she went, oh, he's so hot. I could probably bang Chad Pennington tonight, but no, I'm going to go with Donald Trump because he's so hot. She made these choices herself. I, I don't, this idea that she's now a victim. Ugh. He, the whole thing is that he tried to cover it up. That's the story. It's a cover up. It's that he was cheating on his wife and then the ensuing cover up. I just don't understand why this is such a big deal. It's not. It's not illegal. I mean, well, I mean, the cover up, the way they did that is illegal. But, you know, for a dude to cheat on his wife and then ask the woman he cheated with to not say anything and give her money, that's not illegal. It's not. Now, falsifying, you know, the paper trail and all that kind of stuff when you decide to run for president. That's what the illegal thing is. But, you know, hush money. Hush money. People pay people to shut the fuck up all the time in this world. Hi, Frank. Frank is here. So long story short, I got no interest in that Stormy Daniels story. I don't know what she's going to tell me that's going to make me think any differently than these were two skeevy people who hooked up for skeevy reasons. And now there's this whole skeevy thing that we all got to read about 10 years later or whatever it is. Hell, more than that, right? Because wasn't wasn't Melania pregnant with Baron at the time? <laughs> she cheating on your wife when she's pregnant. I mean, is there anything lower? <sighs> Uh, come on, man. <laughs> I mean, this guy. All right, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. Look, I, we're not a divisive show, but you know I don't like I don't like Trump. I don't like Biden either. Ugh. All right, moving on. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, dynamic pricing. Oh, my God. What is it that they say? What is that great saying? Pioneers. Pioneers get the arrows. Settlers get the land. Yeah, there's two distinct groups of people. Pioneers who show up first, fight the Indians, get slaughtered, take the arrows. And then the next group comes in. The next group, the settlers, they get the land. I've always loved that saying. Pioneers get the arrows, settlers get the land. Well, uh, that's happening with this dynamic pricing. You remember a couple of weeks back when uh, Pioneer in the industry of dynamic pricing pioneer. Remember when uh, Wendy's said that they were going to, uh, they were going to have dynamic pricing, which is basically surge pricing, you know, like Uber does. So your burger will cost you more at certain times when, you know, the lines are longer and all that. Uh, they were the pioneers. Wendy was the, Wendy's were, were the pioneers. They took all kinds of shit. Oh my God. Everybody's like, I can't believe they would do this. And then guess what? Because we are human beings and this is how we work. Everybody moved, everybody moved on. Hell, I think I've been to Wendy's twice since that story broke. I was reminded of how much I like a Dave's Double. Here we are a couple of weeks later, and everybody is now jumping in. Chipotle is going to start giving you dynamic surge pricings. McDonald's is said to be weighing it. Here, I'll read you this story. The settlers are moving in. And by the way, Here's the thing that sucks about it, right? Don't get it twisted. This isn't like, uh, like, like they're trying to make it seem like it's dynamic pricing. The prices will go up and down, you know, based on demand. No, 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 no. So what you're telling me that right now, if a, if a, if a, if a hamburger costs $3, let's say a hamburger costs $3, you're telling me that there's a chance that I could go there and maybe pay two fifty dollars for it because uh, there's no demand? No, that's not what they're saying. It's always going to cost what it costs, but then it's going to go up. It'll go It'll go up. That's the dynamic price. It'll be more expensive. No, it'll never be less expensive. That's not... Holy shit. 
Anyway, a whole bunch of other places are now going to try and force dynamic pricing on us. And we're going to complain and we're going to bitch and we're going to moan. And then, you know, a couple weeks will go by and that'll just be how we buy our food now. How much was that Big Mac today? Cost me $18. Really? I got mine at three o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday for list price. And that's what it'll be. It'll, it'll be list price. Don't think the prices are going to come down. Don't, don't think that they'll know they will, they will cost a hamburger will cost this. It will never cost less than that. It ain't coming down. Sons of bitches. Uh, it's dynamic pricing coming to a business near you. Oh, and they, and they justify it by saying, Oh, this has been done. Uh, you know, the airlines, the airlines is not a hamburger. An airline ticket and all that goes into running an airline is not you making me a fucking hamburger. All right. Totally different things, but no, they're going to tell you, and the airlines do it. So we here at Burger King should do it as well. I know it says that burger costs $4, but it's busy. You had to wait behind three cars. It's $14.50 now. That's how they do it, folks. Uh, here's a story coming out of Chipotle. <laughs> Bad news for Chipotle. You know, they're talking about dynamic pricing. And then they have this story. Uh, a, a dude, a manager at Chipotle. Chipotle manager admits to lewd acts in restaurant dining room, cops say. He was, he was jerking. He was jerking. He was jerking in the dining room. This is a manager of Chipotle. He sat down with a group of girls and started jerking. I'll read you the story. A Chipotle manager exposed himself and masturbated in the dining room of a Pennsylvania restaurant. This, according to police, who say that a female victim felt three squirts of liquid hit her jeans. Man, that had to be exiting with some prime velocity for her to be able to feel that through jeans. But good on you, sister. Uh, when she got up to leave the table where the man had allegedly been pleasuring himself. Following the March 1st incident at the eatery in Camp Hill, a suburb of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, two women went to the local police station to report a sexual assault. The women, one of whom was a former Chipotle employee. Okay, this explains why he was sitting with them, right? Because you're like, why is the manager just sitting with some rando customers? No, no, he, there was probably an association. He's the manager. One of the girls sitting there was a former employee, so that would explain it. Uh, maybe that's why she was fired. She was fired for being too hot. He couldn't control herself. That's, that's why she had to go. <laughs> this is why I had to fire you. See, her fault. Look at me, blaming the victim. Blaming the victim of the spooge and not the spooger. No, I'm definitely going to blame the spooger. This guy's a freak. He ought to be put in a box and treated like human veal for the next five years. Can't do this. This is just, you know, there's just no... When somebody does this, okay, let's... There are certain things that people do. Like, you understand, like, uh, okay, he punched a guy out in line at the 7-Eleven. I, I think we can all understand that. Maybe the guy at the 7-Eleven was being a dick, and it's just he had a bad day, and he just snapped, and he's like, you want to go? Boom, he punches him. I can understand that. I don't understand a guy who's just got to jerk off in the dining room at the Chipotle while sitting at a table with a couple of former employees. I, that person, I don't understand, and I don't think that can be fixed. I think that is something that's the cow is out of the barn that you ain't getting that one back. That thing. How do you fix this guy? So human veal, human, human veal, five years. Like it's not so much of a crime that he needs to lose his entire life, but he needs, he needs something really bad. He needs to go through something really bad so that he thinks about maybe trying to control himself. Did, did he try to control? Can he just not control? Does he have no, I don't know jerking off this is crazy jerking off in a chipotle squirting on some i'm sorry to be so vulgar so graphic but this story let me show you this dude you got a picture of him here uh boom boom let's see here i don't know you tell me does he look like the kind of guy that would jerk off at a <laughs> you know before i saw the picture i had an image of somebody and it wasn't this dude here we go there he is I mean, when I, when I hear somebody does this, uh, you know, if I'm being honest, I think of somebody who looks like me. <laughs> I think it's like, you know, you get accused of doing something like this. I immediately got a cop thinking of a middle-aged white guy. Yeah, I'm thinking of Barney. You know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of me. I'm, I'm thinking of Byron, you know, because we look like we look, we're not that. Uh, we're not that, but we look, you know what I mean? We look, we, we look, 
we look like we have to do that sort of thing. Uh, that's him. No, he's a kid. He's a kid who's not even ugly. He must be really weird because, well, obviously. He must, really? You think he must be weird, do you? I'm pretty sure he's weird. I mean, there's got to be a reason that a guy like this can't get girls. Uh, it says he, well, maybe he can't get girls. Maybe this is his move. Maybe I just don't know what girls are into these days. Well, these ones weren't. The woman, one of whom was a former Chipotle, the women, one of whom was a former Chipotle employee, detailed an encounter with Kasim Ransom, the 26-year-old manager. And, you know, we had such high hopes for Kasim Ransom. 26 years old. He's already elevated himself to manager. 26. 26. That means that when he took the job at Chipotle, he looked around and went, yeah, this is about as good as it gets. So I'm going to do as, I'm going to do as good a job as I can. And he got promoted and he's a 26 year old store manager. It's crazy because that means that on some level he's competent on some level, he is competent to do schedules and the ordering and open and close and all he's competent. He is not competent in being able to not masturbate in the middle of the dining room. One of the women said she saw Ransom touching his penis outside his pants, recalling that she was in denial and looked away. The woman added that Ransom grabbed numerous napkins and placed them down by his penis and subsequently brought one napkin up from his crotch and placed it on the table. The napkin was sticking to itself. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So, what, what, so was it in the napkin or did it, you know fly out on her jeans how how much sexy sauce does this dude have i mean what's worse the second woman reported noticing ransom moving his hands a lot down around his penis adding that she could see him jacking off i love it i love this second girl she doesn't mince words when the former chipotle worker got up to leave the table she felt three squirts of liquid hit her pants during police questioning ransom reportedly confirmed the incident <laughs> <laughs> uh, can we talk to you a minute? Yeah, did you jerk off on these girls in the middle of the dining room? Uh, yeah, yeah. What should I not have? Was was that wrong? Was that was the, I shouldn't have done that? So you're saying okay? All right, noted. Thank you. Wow, appreciate you bringing that to my attention, officer. Had no idea that that was not something that I should do. Ransom was suspended from Chipotle, uh, and if he has not been already, he is expected to be fired. There you go. Look at him. You will never work at a Chipotle again. Oh, yeah, you will. Are you kidding me? You'll never work at a Chipotle again. Get the... You know, like we were talking about yesterday with the whole Nickelodeon thing. Uh, if you listen to the... By the way, you can find that. It's a, it's a special fifth quarter thing that I did yesterday. Um, I think it's called uh, Quiet on the Set... Uh, the Dark Side of Kids TV. It's the story of Nickelodeon and Dan Schneider shows and how Amanda Bynes got all screwed up and how Drake Bell got all screwed up. And it's very good. We did a special thing on it. Um, What was I saying? I totally forgot my... <laughs> I totally forgot where I was going. That's, that's what happens with the stream of consciousness. All right, we're going to move on. Sydney Sweeney. Sydney Sweeney is uh, trending today. She was, uh, I love Sydney Sweeney. I, I love her. I love, I love her for, I, I look, l let me be honest about Sydney Sweeney. Can't take my eyes off her. When she enters a scene, she, what, what do they, what do they call it? She devours the scenery. She just shows up. That's a star. That's what a star does. Someone who you watch before they've done anything because you just got a feeling that they're going to do something interesting. That's her. She's an amazing young actress. She's really good. You just watch, you know, there are different kinds of actors. She's an eye actor. And I haven't seen an eye actor of her level since Winona Ryder. Winona Ryder is like, if you just focus on Winona Ryder's acting and just watch her eyes, she does everything with her eyes. Sydney Sweeney does that as well. She's incredibly talented. I think she's going to be a big, big movie star. Also, incredibly sexy, which is not rare for Hollywood stars. Very sexy woman. Very attractive. You know, she's uh, she's she's a different kind of sexy. She's almost a throwback sexy to the days before Pam Anderson fake boobs and all of that. She's a very large-breasted, 
busty woman, natural, with big, beautiful doe eyes. I mean, she's like, you know, she's the all-American, you know, farm girl or whatever. So she's got all of the boxes checked, and I believe she's going to be a major star. However, she is complaining and she is angry. She is sick and tired of people thinking that she's sexy. She does not want, she doesn't, she doesn't understand why every time she goes out, you know, people are always about what she's wearing and people are always about her breasts and all this. And, you know, okay. Um, but you need to do a little heavy lifting there, Sydney, which means that you need to start walking red carpets and burlap bags. You need to start wearing pants, maybe sweaters, how about a nice jacket? Because quite frankly, you have been dressing in a way that has been designed to exploit your sexuality. You're a very sexy woman and you've been in Hollywood and we don't see you at the mall, Sydney. All we see you at are the official functions that you do throughout the course of your pursuit of stardom which is walking red carpets, giving interviews at award shows, that kind of thing. Sydney, I love you, girl, but you just hosted Saturday Night Live and every single sketch you were in had something to do with you being hot. So please don't come in. Now, let me just, let's just do this. Let's just take a look. Oh my God, really? I have to verify it's me again. This is a second time now in two hours that Google has required that I verify who I am. All right. Did I do it right? I did. Um, and by the way, don't get this twisted. I, I, I'm not doing the whole, you know, she shouldn't address that way if she didn't want to be raped. Stop it. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is if she wants to be taken seriously as an actress from this point forward. And she wants to move away from how she's been exploited because of her, you know, beautiful assets. <laughs> we'll call them that. Um, you know, that's, that's a, that's a thing. That's a her decision. That is not. So here, I want to look at this. Let me just pull these up. Let's see. Let's just look at some random pictures of Sydney Sweeney and let's see how she has branded herself. Let's see if it's uh, fits her complaint. Hold on. Maybe not. Who knows? Maybe not. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So let's, here we go. Let's just randomly pull up some pictures of the beautiful and the talented Sydney Sweeney, who is complaining about something that I just don't think she should be. Here you go. Okay. That's just a rando picture. We're just going to flip through some rando pictures and see, cause she's, you know, complaining about how guys are, you know, just totally into her. She's such a great actress. She doesn't have to be sexually exploited the way she is. But again, the point of this is I believe she has been self-sexually exploiting or at least been signing off on the sexual exploitation. Um, you know, she's a beautiful woman. And it's a beautiful woman. I don't think there's anything necessarily over the top here. All right, this, she, come on. Don't tell me that you're not, you look like a virgin bride. You know, showing it off. Showing, that's pretty. She's pretty. She's a beautiful girl. Um, because she looks like uh, in this picture, this picture right here, she looks like a virgin goddess. I mean, that's the choice that she made when she went out. I don't want people to see me as a sex object. Hey, do you like my virgin goddess outfit? It looked like I'm about to be sacrificed. I mean, so look, Sydney, stop it. Don't do this. She's, ugh. You're a beautiful woman, and I think you've got an incredible career ahead of you. But my God, stop complaining that you know you're being exploited for your sexuality when you're going out dressed like a virgin Greek goddess. I don't know. We don't need that. All right. Uh, what else do we have here? No, oh, let's talk about Nickelodeon. That was the big story from the last couple of nights. ID, you can now see it on Max. ID had a special, a four-part docu-series about all the crazy shit that was going on at Nickelodeon in the 1990s. Uh, it's called uh, Dark Side of Kids TV. It's called uh, it's called Quiet on the Set, the Dark Side of Kids TV. And get it, Quiet on the Set, because nobody's nobody was talking. Nobody was talking about what was happening there. Um, there are big protests going on right now outside Nickelodeon Studios. I think that uh, I I I'm I think something might happen. I mean, I don't know what could happen. I don't, but. 
they're certainly being called on the carpet. And this is one of the things that I said yesterday when you, when, when I did the special fifth quarter thing where I broke down the four hour, four part series, um, ah, Nickelodeon skated completely free on all of this. Nickelodeon is the one who hired three pedophiles. You know, they, they were three sex offenders, pedophiles that they hired and then put on children shows. And by the way, it's not just Nickelodeon as is pointed out in the four part series. Um, Brian Peck, I'm going to say his name today. I didn't say his name yesterday. Brian Peck, known as Pickle Boy, who just systematically molested Drake Bell over a period of time, uh, essentially, I mean, just screwing that poor kid up. Um, he was hired as an acting coach and he was even a star. He was one of not a star, but he's one of the characters that appeared on all that and a number of other Nickelodeon shows. He was Pickle Boy. We talked about him, Brian Peck. Brian Peck was arrested for all this child pornography and for molesting the shit out of Drake Bell. And really, as Drake Bell said in the special, he wouldn't talk about it. But he said, imagine, imagine the absolute worst thing that he could have done to me as a 14-year-old kid. Imagine the absolute worst thing that he could have done to me. And then double that. That's what he did. So that's all they would say about it. But then later we saw the, when he was arrested, we saw the actual charges that he was convicted of and the charges were specific. So yeah, it was all the worst thing that you could do to a 14 year old boy who was neither horny nor homosexual, right? That's, so he does that. So Brian Peck, this guy who works as pickle boy and is an acting coach for all of these kids on the sets at Nickelodeon, he, he gets convicted and he goes to jail for years as a child molester, gets out of jail. He's got to register as a sex offender. He is never working in this business again, right up until the Disney channel hires him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Disney channel hired him goes from Nickelodeon to, to doing the exact same thing at the Disney Channel. It's fucking crazy. Um, so I don't know. I just, I just think that Nickelodeon, I think Nickelodeon, I don't even know if it's the same people in charge. I, you know, whatever. I, can you fire the guy who's the CEO now because he was, you know, if he wasn't there, I don't know, but there are big protests happening out in front of Nickelodeon and, uh, we'll be watching that. Uh, speaking of that whole story, Dan Schneider, Schneider, Remember I told you about Dan Schneider? He's the super producer behind all of these shows. He was one of the prime targets of the docuseries, Dan Schneider, and his behavior and the way he ran a set. Um, Dan Schneider, and again, not to be confused with disgraced former Washington fo football team owner, Dan Schneider. That's Snyder, Dan Snyder. This is Dan Schneider. Uh, Dan Schneider took to a podcast yesterday and, and gave a, uh, I, I watched the whole podcast. My buddy, Kevin in the chat room, he was cool enough to find it first and then sent it to me. And so I watched it yesterday. It was only about 20 minutes, but the premise of it is, is that Dan Schneider is now answering, you know, for all of the things that were charged against him. Um, a couple of problems. I had a couple of problems with it. Uh, one of the problem, one of the problems, just off the box, uh, right out of the box, uh, Dan Schneider, a man who is 60 ish, 60, 61, Dan Schneider is making some fashion choices that, uh, do not, do not help with the guy who's associated with pedophile. He looks like such a creeper because he is dying his beard and he is dying his hair jet black. And doesn't look good. It's like, that's, oh my God, that doesn't look good, man. I know you think it makes you look younger, but no, you just look weird. You got an old man's face with a 20-year-old's hair. So it's just very weird. That's right out of the box. The second thing that bothered me about the sit-down was it was, it was, it was revealed to be very duplicitous. It was revealed to be a put-on. It was shown to us, it was presented as... Uh, it's being hosted. The podcast is hosted by a kid who used to work on iCarly. So it's somebody who worked with Dan. And it's presented to us. He says, he goes, so when I finished watching all four of these, the first thing I did was I picked up the phone and I called Dan. And I said, Dan, do you want to talk about all of this? And Dan, thank you so much for saying yes. And, and he's, oh, well, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad you called. I'm glad you gave me this opportunity. I was really hoping I would have it. And I really want it. Okay. 
So that's how it's presented, right? We're supposed to think, oh, these are two people that used to work together. And this guy, he saw what Dan was going through and he was there and picked up the phone and called Dan and said, Dan, why don't you come and talk about it? Okay, so about you know 15 minutes into the thing, it's revealed that that's bullshit because they both at different times slip up and admit that they watched it together. <laughs> Dan does it first. Dan goes, well, no. And you remember when we were watching it, I turned to you and I said, right? That totally flies in the face of the way it was presented, the way it was. So I saw this and I picked up the photo and I called Dan and Dan was good enough to join us. Dan, thank you so much for being brave enough to show up. It was it was really bad. It was a, it was an actor. The, the podcast kid from iCarly I is, is a man probably in his thirties now. He's a grown up, but he's not an interviewer. He's an actor pretending to be an interview. And you know how I know it? Because he said, he kept saying, now I'm going to push back on that. Now I'm going to, now you're not going to like me when I ask this question. He set the premise that he was going to ask him a hardball question to dupe the audience into going, oh, he asked hard questions. He even said, I'm going to push back here. But then he would ask like a softball question. He would ask a question that was just teed up for Dan Schneider. So here's what it is. Dan Schneider is a very powerful, still, still very important producer in television, children's television. Probably got a big old bag of money. This dude was a rando on iCarly for about five years in his teens. He hasn't done anything since. He still considers his association with Dan to be his best tie in Hollywood. So they concocted this thing to make it look like Dan was so upset about the way he was portrayed that, that oh my God, I'm so lucky that this, this kid, well, you know me, uh, you worked for me. You know, that's what they kept saying. Like they got into the issue of of race about how, you know, some of the black kids early on felt like they were being tokened, you know, which is fine. I, I happen to not agree with that because I didn't, I mean, I saw very diverse casts in all of his shows. So I don't believe that. But then the host of the podcast, who is also a, a black man, he goes, now I'm going to get into the whole race thing. He goes, but, but you know me, I never had a problem with it. And it like became like this really uncomfortable thing where he was going out of his way to say that Dan wasn't, you know, racially motivated in his casting. And maybe that's true. I, it might be true because certainly his show, I mean, he's the guy behind Good Burger. He's the, he made Keenan and Kel superstars, right? Every one of his shows, there is a cross section of people, different complexions, you know. So I don't think that it's necessarily true that he's he's a racist. I don't think that. A misogynist. I think he's a misogynist for sure. Anyway, let's take a look at a little bit of this. Uh, this is the interview from yesterday. Uh, hold on. We do have clips from it. Or actually, we got more than clips. We just got the straight up interview. So I'm just going to play it. <sighs> boom, 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 boom. Here we go. And then we'll fast forward to the. All right, here you go. And by the way, some of you guys who are younger than me, you might know who this person is. You you might know who this host of this podcast is. Maybe you've seen Hi Carly. I have never seen Hi Carly. So I have no idea who this person is. Again, I've never seen Hi Carly because one, I'm not a pedophile and that seems like a show that my 40 something year old ass should not have been knowing about. Uh and two, I am not a pedophile. <laughs> I was not interested at all. I know it's the same thing. All right, here you go. Let's watch a little bit of this. This is uh, Dan Schneider. I'll try and fast forward to some of the things I had a problem with. Another thing that I had a problem with, you know, this is the one thing that I do want to show you. He was asked about the Amanda Bynes situation. And one of the one of the things about being able to... Oh, am I sharing this? Hold on, I shouldn't share it yet. One of the things about being able to manipulate people you know, you know, you know, that thing Hitler was really great at the, the, one of the things about being able to manipulate people is to declare a, 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 a sense of normalcy around something that is highly abnormal. The example that I'll give you here with the Dan Schneider is he starts talking about Amanda Bynes downfall and how it all started when Amanda Bynes tried to become emancipated from her parents at 15 
Dan Schneider goes on to talk about this like it's the totally normal thing she wanted help with, that she wanted to be away from her parents. She was 15, and, you know, I, I cared about her, and she wanted this, so I did what she wanted, and I helped her. He's trying to norm. He even says, it's quite common. It is quite common people get emancipated from. He tried to normalize this. The fact of the matter is he revealed himself to be somebody who didn't have her best interests at heart. He just wanted her emancipated what are you doing? The dog is dog is barking. He wanted her emancipated so that he didn't have to deal with her meddling parents when it came to, you know, trips to New York and promoting this show. That was the thing. But like a great manipulator, he establishes that it's totally normal for people to take 14 year olds away from their parents in Hollywood. Fucking sick, man. All right, here, let's watch a little bit of this. We won't watch the whole thing, but I'll fast forward to a couple of key points. Hey, it's Boogie. I play T-Bow on Nickelodeon's iCarly. I got a chance to watch the Quiet On Set program and I reached out to Dan to see if it was something. By the way, is Boogie somebody? Is Do you guys know Boogie? I, again, I didn't watch iCarly. I don't know who Boogie is. That he'd be willing to discuss. I'm pleased to say that he said yes. Dan, how are you? I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay. I, I, I'm okay. I've been better, you know. It's, uh, it's been a rough 48 hours, as you can imagine. Look, look at the fashion choices this freaking guy is making here. What is, what is up with this guy? What is it, first of all, the jet black hair and the jet black beard does not fit with the 60-something-year-old face. Put a collared shirt on and a sport coat. You can't clean yourself up. The whole world has just been led to believe that you're some sort of leader of a pedophile army. And you, you show up looking like the guy who lives across the street that the parents don't like you talking to. What are you doing? All right, I got the dog out. The dog is literally, she's never doing this. She's, all right, you, you, let's watch a little bit of this and I'm gonna go let the dog out. I'll be right back. I'm okay. Um, I really appreciate you reaching out and giving me the opportunity to talk to you about uh, what we saw over the last two nights. I'm really glad you're here because I believe this is important. For sure. Uh, we've got a lot of things to unpack. Um, but before I dive into my list of topics that I'd like to discuss, is there anything you'd like to start off with? Absolutely. Watching over the past two nights was very difficult. Me facing my past behaviors, um, some of which are embarrassing and that I regret. And I definitely owe some people a pretty strong apology. Let's talk about the massages. Okay. Watching the content yesterday, it was disturbing. It was wrong. It was wrong that I ever put anybody in that position. It was the wrong thing to do. I'd never do it today. I'm embarrassed that I did it then. I apologize to anybody that I ever put in that situation. And even additionally, I apologize to the people who were walking around Video Village or wherever they happened because there were lots of people there who witnessed it who also may have felt uncomfortable. So I owe them an apology as well. Yeah. Dan, talk to me about the writer's room. From what I saw, not cool. No, no, and I, I don't mean to cut you off, but if I can cut right to the chase, let me just say, no writer should ever feel uncomfortable in any writer's room, ever, period, the end, no excuses. Um, <laughs> Just, did you see that? From what I saw, not cool, man. Oh, come on, that is not how a legitimate interview goes. You are allowing him the opportunity. And look, to Dan Schneider's credit in this, and he does deserve some credit for this, um, he didn't double down. He didn't come out and try and fight it. He didn't, I'm just going to liars. And no, he accepted responsibility to a point. He also spent a lot of time in this thing saying, yeah, Nickelodeon. Uh, yeah. Okay. I made some mistakes there, but Nickelodeon knew all this was going like he kept kicking it upstairs, which is interesting. And I happen to agree with that. I think that there is some culpability, some, Large scale culpability on the part of Nickelodeon. Um, here, let me see. I want to get to his explanation of Amanda Bynes. That's the thing I want to show you. Let's talk.
all right, so what they're talking about here is uh, we, 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 we jumped into a little bit of this yesterday. Some of the questionable situations that he and his comedy writers were putting these children in. The sexual innuendo, and you know, we watched a whole bunch of like uh, Ariana Grande stuff. A beautiful, innocent little 12, 13 year old Ariana Grande laying on a bed in what looks like lingerie. I'm sorry, I, I it looks like she's in lingerie and she's pouring water all over herself. So, this is him trying to explain away that how those situations occurred. Oh, hold on. Bosses said, if they insisted, you've got to make a change here. you got to cut that. I had to do it. I had no choice. Got it. Now this next one. So what he's saying there is that every sketch, every bit of content that ever went out, Nickelodeon approved. So now all these years later, you're saying, what a bunch of pervs. How could he do that? He's saying, how could Nickelodeon allow that? <laughs> I submitted everything to the Nickelodeon censors and there are censors because it's a child show. And at every turn, they all went, yeah, that's cool. And that's, that's what Dan Schneider is saying. Kind of hit close to home. Mm -hmm. uh, being a new father, I wouldn't be opposed to, to my child being in the entertainment industry. It doesn't matter what age. Yeah. Seeing some of those on air dares. Seen it now. Okay. So uh, we don't need to get into this. I want to get into the Amanda Bynes stuff nothing to do with paying writers i never even in your salary you can both case and they split a salary all three else's journey mm -hmm. yeah i can talk about my experience how my experience was with you what i saw prior to working with you but again i don't want to speak on anyone's journey i saw you be honored for diversity in your work yes and the reason for that is diversity has always been very important all right, so one of the things that he was accused of, it was, uh, you know, not uh, taking black characters seriously and just having them be tokens. And this is what I mean by this being a complete setup interview. God, I'm going to have a black person make me explain the charges against me of being someone who marginalized black actors. And before this black actor that I have doing, he's going to say that he was there and he didn't see any of this. <laughs> That's like, that's amazing. If you can get that, that's good. This is all a setup. Important to me, my as it all, and everyone's very exceptionally proud, and that gives me a great. Did your relationship with the cast? Yeah, it bothered me too. Yeah, just me being under that was brought up in the series, mm -hmm. and her. That's all right, here it. you go. They came to you. This is it. Versus being there. So he's gonna go into the Amanda Bynes story which is terrible. This is again, master manipulation where he attempts to normalize the concept for, for this conversation. He normalizes the concept of child emancipation, which is not a normal thing, but he presents it like it is so that everybody watching goes, well, if that's normal, then he seems to have done everything by the book. That's what a manipulation is. It's not normal. It is not normal. If, if, if a 16 year old child comes to you, like you, you're running the burger joint and a 16 year old comes to you, right? Maybe they're your shift manager and they're great. And they come to you and they say, I want to be emancipated. As the manager of the burger point joint who employs this girl, you probably aren't going, well, yes, I'm with you. No, if you care about them, you're talking to them and you're explaining to them that this is, you can't be emancipated, but no, not a big Hollywood producer because he knew we're not talking about burger joint money. We're talking about Amanda Bynes starring in money. And at that point, he just saw that he just saw his meal ticket. So here you go. Let's listen to this. Here. I knew the dynamic was trust. I understood that in situations where they may have had turmoil, whether it be with their families, whether it be other castmates, they came to you versus how they made you look. With that said, Amanda Bynes. All right, and, and also, this is exactly what I said yesterday. I said that it did seem to be a bit of a hit piece against Dan Schneider. They were there was this whole storyline about all this child molesting, molesting that was going on and all these abusive people, predators that were on set. And then there was also the storyline of what a dick boss Dan Schneider was. And I, they made attempts to blur that line, to make us all think that Dan Schneider was somehow one of these child predators. I didn't buy it. I didn't buy it. What I, what I said yesterday was, you know, for the stars, at least, for the stars, 
he did seem to be somebody that they really trusted and that they really would go to when they were having problems. And he really did seem. Now, granted, his motivation was this is a star and I'm making so much money. So, yeah, I'll be really kind and good with them. So that's what I witnessed. And that's kind of what this guy is saying here. Was brought up in the series. Mm -hmm. With that said, Amanda Bynes was brought up in the series mm -hmm. and her emancipation and how you were involved in that. Can you talk to us about it a bit? Sure. Um, Amanda was between the ages of 16 and 17, and she wanted to get emancipated from her parents, mm. which was a fairly common thing with successful young actors. No, it's not. It's not a fairly common thing. In fact, when it happens, it usually makes big news, and that person is being emancipated because they've got some shady-ass agent or a Svengali producer like Dan Schneider here, who is whispering in their ears that there is too much money to be made for them to be worried about what mommy thinks. That's, it's not common. But the way he's discussing it, look, he's laying it out there like, look, you, you people in Iowa, you don't understand Hollywood. It's fairly common. Um, Amanda was between the ages of 16 and 17, and she wanted to get emancipated from her parents, mm. which was a fairly common thing with successful <laughs> young actors at least at the time, sure. um, and she wanted that for herself. So she turned to her team, which included her lawyer, her agent, her manager, her publicist, me, because she included me as part of All right, that's the other problem that I had with this. He goes through the list of people that she had on her team, and then he says, and it included me, because, you know, she included little old me, because I was just there, and she's like, I trust him, and I want him involved. Who do you think? When Amanda Bynes, when he discovered Amanda Bynes at nine years old and decided she was a star, okay, he was first through the door. He's the one who discovered her. Who do you think hired her team? Do you think it was nine-year-old Amanda or do you think it was Dan Schneider who went, okay, look, agent, you're, you're a buddy of mine. We got, we got one here. You take this. Lawyers, we're going to use the lawyers. We all... He's distancing himself from the Svengali role. Everyone knows that he was her Svengali, okay? And he's, he's now, dis and she included me because she trusted me. No, 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 no. All those people that you just named, she had working for her, probably because you as the executive producer and the person who discovered her, probably sent her to those people. She tried to get emancipated and ended up, and she wanted that for herself. So she turned to her team, which included her lawyer, her agent, her manager, her publicist, me, because she included me as part oh, of her team. Just by happenstance. We supported her. She tried to get emancipated and ended up not working out. She didn't. Well, since we're here, let's stay here for a moment. There was also an incident. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's like, just like that's totally normal. Do you know what that did to Amanda Bynes? That, that, remember the time when you were 16 and you told your parents you didn't want to be around them anymore and you wanted to just completely be away and lead your own life and then that didn't work and that night after court you had to go back home to parents' house? I mean, and he's just like, eh, didn't work out. We went on, we shot a couple more seasons with absolutely no regard for what that damage, what is the wake of that for a teenage girl now with her parents? Where she had ran away from home, if yes. you would. Um, can you talk to us a little bit just to clear the air of exactly what happened in that situation? Yes. Uh, one night, it was very late, well after midnight, one or two in the morning, phone rang, I answered, it was Amanda. She was upset, she was in distress, she had had some conflict with her parents, I think her father, and she called me. I was immediately concerned about her safety. I called someone who I knew was fairly nearby. That person was able to go and pick her up. Then I knew she was safe. I felt better. She ended up being taken to the police. Well, regardless of what some people may think, I think it's only positive that you are there for people when they need you. <laughs> that said, let's talk about some of the things that are just... All right, that's enough. <laughs> that's, you know, now I'm going to push back a little. Now you're not going to like some of my questions. Well, I just need to say that I think that that's all positive. Stop it. Stop it. 
it was it was I'm, look i'm glad it happened i i was very interested in hearing dan schneider respond to all of these things so that, that's interesting i'm glad it happened but oh my god was that a work piece <laughs> that was hey you know me from my carly and now i'm gonna bring the guy in who discovered me and i've stayed close to for the last 15 years and he's taking some shit in the media right now but i'm gonna pretend like i'm a hardball barbara walters type but really i'm just gonna give you some of the lamest larry king bullshit you ever did see anybody give a shit about dog breeds uh, the frenchie is the uh, most popular dog breed in america for like the seventh year in a row frenchies not a dog a frenchie is not a dog it's a it's a fashion accessory you want to know what a dog is a golden retriever is a dog a german shepherd is a dog a beagle is a dog poodle's a dog Frenchies aren't dogs. I don't know what they are. They're weird. They're like too small. Aren't they one of those dogs that you have to have like special, like you got their ears clipped and you got to get their like, no, they're like, aren't they like just a high impact, like big trouble dog? I don't know why it's the most important and favorite dog in America, but it is the Frenchie, the French bulldog. And, and isn't that the, like the pussiest of the bulldogs, <laughs> right? The Frenchie, that's the pussy bulldog. It ain't the American bulldog. The big, fat, slovenly, you know, humorously adorable bulldog. That's the English bulldog. The American bulldog is the badass, right? I think it is. That's what I got. I got a, I got what's known as a Catahoula leopard bulldog hybrid. We thought she was just a straight up Catahoula, Catahoula leopard dog. Um, but it, it turns out she just looks too much. She doesn't like you look at a Catahoula and you look at her and you're like, yeah, she's got all the markings and she's got the, the, the things on her paws that Catahoulas have because they swim in water and stuff. So she's got all of that. But she, why is she so much more muscular than other ones? And then we saw the breed, the American, the Catahoula is very popularly bred with the American bulldog. That's what we got. That's my girl. She's a, she's a Catahoula bulldog. Those are the cool bulldogs, rightfully so. The American bulldog. Look, the other bulldogs are cool too, I guess. The English bulldog, that's just a funny dog. That's the, the English bulldog is just like, oh, you've got like a four-year life expectancy. You know, it's just a weird, unhealthy looking thing, but they're adorable. And who doesn't love an English bulldog? But the Frenchies, apparently they're the biggest ones. The French bulldog, number one dog in the world. America, let's say America. I don't know, I can click on it, but really I don't want to. Uh, let's see here. What is, is it the most popular U.S. breed? Yeah, it's the most popular U.S. breed, the French Bulldog. Was there a movement years ago to change the name from the French Bulldog to the Freedom Bulldog? Did we have, did you have a Freedom Bulldog? That's what I'm going to start doing. Let's all start doing that. That'll be hysterical. Every time you see somebody with a French Bulldog, call it a Freedom Bulldog. Just see where that goes. <sighs> America is not happy. Um, I don't know who does this. This is published in Fortune today. It is a poll of the world's happiest nations. And uh, for the eighth year in a row, guess what? For the eighth year in a row, man, the top three happiest nations in the world where the people are just happy and are cool. You know what they are? For the eighth year in a row, the happiest country in the world is Finland. The second happiest country in the world for the eighth year in a row is Denmark. Hey, when did Denmark get so happy? Denmark, Denmark wasn't always happy. Denmark produced Vikings. Those guys were pissed. Those guys did not like what was going on in Denmark. They sought out to just rape and pillage and kill. The number three happiest country in the world for the eighth year in a row, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you my favorite place on earth, Iceland. So ask ourselves this, why, why are the Nordic company countries, why are they, they are all Nordic, what do they call them? Social democracies, so capitalist, socialism, whatever it is, I don't know what it is. But eight years in a row, man, people in those countries are like, yeah, it's cool. Now, I will say this. You know why they're happy? Because they don't have a defense budget like we have, which means that we got to get involved in all the bullshit all over the world. When was the last time a 
something bad happened in the Persian Gulf and the Icelandic Navy went, ah, weird, looks like a job for us. No, those people do not carry the burden of responsibility that we here in America have somehow shouldered for all these years. Uh, moving on, top 20, after Iceland, you got Sweden, and then you got Israel. We might have to reshuffle the deck on that. I don't know how happy the people, I mean, this was, you know, I don't know if the people in Israel are all that happy currently, but they certainly make the list. Uh, then we got the Netherlands, which is just in that more Viking stuff. Uh, Norway, more Viking stuff. Luxembourg. I, I don't know what Luxembourg is. What is what is Luxembourg? Well, where is that? Is that a country? Like, honestly, if you, I see it, I know it's a country now. I'm looking at it. It's listed as a country. But five hours ago, if you'd have been like, for a million dollars, Luxembourg, city or country, go. And I had to answer. I'd go, stop that city. <laughs> Luxembourg sounds like a city. Sounds like a city that's in the Netherlands. Maybe it's a country in the Netherlands. I don't know. I don't know. And then Switzerland and Australia round out the uh, top 20 happiest countries in the world. Happiest countries in the world for young people in this weird, in this weird Number one, the young people in Lithuania are happier than anywhere else in the world. By the way, Amer America didn't make top 20 in any of these categories. Americans are not happy. Just look around. My God, wouldn't it be nice to be happy? This is why Iceland made such an impression on me. Those fucking people were awesome. <laughs> Those people just randos too. Like, you know, they find out you're a tourist and... It's not like here in America where somebody finds out you're a tourist and they're like, let's follow them back to their hotel room and steal everything. No, like Iceland, it's like they find out you're a tourist. They get all excited. They're like, oh, here's what you got to do. They're just nice people. They just seem like they're in a good mood. Lithuania is the happiest country for people under 30. Israel, Serbia, and Iceland. Iceland rolling out the top five. Happiest country for people 60 and older, uh, Denmark. Finland, Norway, it's all the same ones. Iceland, it's all the same ones. Uh, although this one, we come in at 20. United States. The United States, if you're over 60, if you're a really old, angry person, you are really happy being old and angry in this country. United States. There you go. Happiest country. Fucking dog is barking. I gotta go let the dog in. I've already gone over two hours. We're still rolling, gang. Hold on. Gotta let the damn dog in. Let me get on that. Good girl. Eat your lunch. Go eat your lunch. Eat. She did that thing. Your dogs, your dogs ever do that thing where, I don't know, maybe you got a dog door. Is this right? I think this is right. Um, your dog ever do that thing where you open the door and they're, they're sitting in the doorway and they're looking up at you and you just step out of the way and you leave the door open. You're staring there. You're staring at the dog, and she's staring at you. And you're like, "Are you coming in or not?" And she's just like, "Okay, I'm coming." What are you, a vampire? You got to be invited in. Uh, okay, so here's a fun one. Here's something fun we can do. Uh, this one is who put this out? Uh, okay, so I pulled it off MSN, but this is the Athletic. Okay, here's a story from the Athletic. Now, I, I can only get these uh, these athletic stories when they're aggregated to other news sites because um, I'm not willing to pay for the athletic, which I understand. I wish I, I wish I was. Honestly, honestly, if I could, I'd pay for the athletic. I would pay because that's some good sports journalism going on over there. It's just, you know, they, they got a paywall. I can't do it. I, but I would, if I could, I would. If I could, I would. Um, but here's a story. The five teams... This is an in-depth, again, I turned it into a list. It's actually just an article, but I turned it into a list. Uh, these are the teams and their Super Bowl windows, okay? So this is, uh, let me, how did I do this? Okay, so these are teams, not every team in the league, but these are just teams that are thought to have a Super Bowl window. And this is a combination of writers 
deciding whether or not that window is wide open or closing shut. Okay, so here we go. Uh, the very first team we talk about is the Kansas City Chiefs. It says here that Kansas City, now they two-time defending Super Bowl champions. It says here, Kansas City Chiefs, is their window wide open or is it shut? Or shutting, I should say. Uh, it's wide open. Wide open. They said, yeah, no, they're, they're in pretty good shape. Uh, the next team is the uh, Buffalo Bills. The Buffalo Bills. Uh, we've been talking about Buffalo Bills, man. They're a glamour team for the last couple of years. Everybody's favorite. Everybody rooting for the Buffalo boys, right? Window shutting. Window. And it doesn't even say shutting. The consensus is slammed, slammed shut. Uh, how many more chances does this corn need to break through? Advancing to the 2020 AFC championship game was supposed to serve as the first big step forward for this group and not their peak. <laughs> But sadly, it has been their peak. All right, Buffalo Bills slam shut. Detroit Lions wide open. And then the Detroit Lions are wide open, and this team is. I got no hatred for the Detroit Lions. I'm an NFC North guy. I'm an NFC North guy. I'm a Bears guy. I despise the Minnesota Vikings. I despise the Green Bay Packers. But I got I got no hate. I got no hate for the Lions. I like the Lions. They've, they've, they've never been a threat. That's that's what it is. They've never been a threat. Now, the Lions, uh, when I was younger, uh, the Lions used to just, I don't know if it was every Thanksgiving, but there was a bunch of Thanksgivings that the Lions just ruined for me because the Bears would play them, and this was in the Barry Sanders era, and it was just so frustrating. It's just uh, the Lions, their Super Bowl window is wide open. How about the Minnesota Vikings? Also a team that was thought to be, oh, well, they got Justin Jefferson. They got a defense that looks great. They got Daniel Hunter. They got all this stuff. They got Kirk Cousins. And look at what Kevin O'Connell has done for Kirk Cousins. He's unlocked the monster inside, and their window is shut. <laughs> it says Minnesota's window is uh, shut. I'll tell you what Minnesota should do. Minnesota should be looking at trading Justin Jefferson. Go full trade down. Go full tear down. They ain't got a quarterback. They got Sam Darnold. They need a quarterback. I don't know if they're going to get anybody in the chat. They need a quarterback there. Kevin O'Connell. Let him work with the quarterback. So here's what you do. You sell. You get rid of Justin Jefferson right now this year. You get yourself. Uh, you get yourself another number one this year. You get yourself number one next year. Maybe you get yourself a number two next year. Maybe you get yourself. You could get a ransom for Justin Jefferson. Whatever it is. You rebuild with those picks, Minnesota. I don't know why I'm giving Minnesota advice. They're in my division. They look like a trash heap right now. After being a team that, like, for the last couple of years, you're like, this, they're going to, this. Oh, I'm afraid of the Vikings. They can rise. They can scare you. And then they never did. They never did. Houston Texans says their window is wide open. Wide open. Everybody's excited. New Orleans Saints slam shut. Slam shut. Chicago Bears. My Chicago Bears. Wide open. Wide open. Well, let's see if we got our quarterback. Let's let's see if we got our quarterback. And then if this rookie quarterback can actually have a good rookie season, that's not a that's not a given. <sighs> Baltimore Ravens, wide open. Baltimore Ravens, wide open. New York Jets, slam yeah. shut. Yeah. New yeah. York Jets, they yeah. say slam shut. They got nothing. Forget it. Give up on Rodgers. He's completely done. They got nobody waiting in the wings. New York Jets, 49ers. 49ers says wide open. Perennial, perennially, perennially. 49ers, wide open. Uh, and we'll finish out with uh, the last one on here. Your Dallas Cowboys right here. Dallas Cowboys uh, yeah. slam shut. Yeah. <laughs> Slammed. Shot. Uh, it says here three straight 12 win seasons, three straight MVP like years from Dak Prescott, three straight years of finishing with a top four scoring offense and a top seven scoring defense. Ooh, tell me that doesn't sound good. The results one playoff win in that period. All right. And then they go on to talk about, you know, salary cap, hell and aging veterans and free agent poaching and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, let's see. What else do we have here? Ta-da! That's it, folks. That's it for today's show. 
Uh, Leslie C says, do a DNA test on CeeLo. Well, she was a bum box puppy dog. The, uh, the, it was a, it was a vet who told us that she's the, she's a fair, which is, they say is fairly common, fairly common in, in Louisiana, uh, who said that she was a Catahoula leopard and an American bulldog here. I'm going to show you pictures. Uh, they're, they're, they're common. They're common because unfortunately the Catahoula is a very, very common dog in Louisiana. It's the state dog of Louisiana. Hold on. But they, they look a very, they look a certain way. They, they look a certain way. And unfortunately there's a lot of hillbillies that like to fight dogs. So over the years they've mixed the Catahoula who is an amazing athlete it's like, it's like the Lamar Jackson of dogs. Seriously, they climb, they climb trees chasing bears. I mean, they can jump over any wall. I've told you the stories about my Catahoula, how this yard cannot contain her. She will get out and then she will run. They are fast like greyhounds. But in order to make a better fighting dog, they mixed her with the muscular, strong-jawed American bulldog. And that's what, uh, that's what they think we got here. The Catahoula bulldog. So let's see some pictures. Oh, what did you little babies? Look at the I, okay. I'm gonna turn into a dog weirdo. Oh, look at that little baby. That doesn't look like mine. Oh, look at that guy. Oh yeah, that, CeeLo's about twice the size of that one, as far as like chest and girth. Yeah, that one looks like CeeLo. That's that's more like CeeLo, thick like that. <laughs> <laughs> Look at these guys. This is a wonderful dog breed, you guys. I was not familiar with this dog breed until this dog came into my life. Look at this guy. Now, that's a Catahoula Bulldog. That's Catahoula Bulldog. That's a big one, though. That one's that's that's more Catahoula. That's more Catahoula. That's a little guy. Look at him. All right. There you go. I love this breed. I, lo I love this breed of dog, but it's new to me. Um, it is so e he 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 says she's crazy, she's nuts in the head. It's not nuts in the head. That's just the breed. The, the breed is just like the wheels are spinning all the time, and they're constantly trying to figure out something to to do. They're very good at being protection dogs, they're very good at baying animals, they're very good at keeping, you know the livestock in their pens. They're, they're just, they, they need a job. She doesn't have a job. So she suffers from the zoomies when she sees people. And you know, that, that makes people go, that dog's nuts. I'm like, no, no, she's not. Oh, not an apartment dog though. If you're looking for a breed for an apartment, do not get a cat, a Louisiana Catahoula leopard dog. They, uh-uh. All right, guys, that's going to do it. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Uh, I don't think we're going to do a fifth quarter today. I eh, know I probably I said maybe, maybe, but James Parker, he needs me to do a thing at 430. I got to go. I got to go to FedEx. Ugh. I got to go to FedEx. Then I got to go. I got to I got to go food shopping. Oh, God. Got the kid coming this weekend. And then I got to be back by 430 in order to talk with James. Oh, by the way, here's what I think I'm going to do on James. I'm going to talk Nickelodeon. I think, I think, why not, right? I mean, if I'm the entertainment reporter over there for WBAP's James Parker show, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna be the entertainment reporter, I should probably talk about the main entertainment story of the week that I've been obsessing on. So there you go. We'll do that. You can hear me. You can hear more hot takes. Although I gotta be honest, I, I don't. I don't. I love James, and I love you know any look. I love the opportunity. He's like, hey, come on and promote the stream, and I love that, and uh, I appreciate being there. But it's such a different dynamic from what I am used to engaging with James in. Like I, I have to be the guy. Like I have to. I can't interrupt him. I got. He controls my mic. He has. You know, it's his job to keep me quiet to control what he wants. So I'm still trying to figure that out. So the last few, the last few, I felt I, I was, I was rushing a little bit, and sometimes when I rush, I sound stupid. Sometimes when I don't rush, I sound stupid. 
because I kind of am stupid. All right, if you want to help out the show, you can drop a little something, whether you call it a donation, whether you call it support for this style of non-divisive current events driven hot talk, whatever it is, I'll leave that up. I'm going to uh, I'm going to go I'm going to go now and we'll be back tomorrow at noon, okay? Thank you so much. I love you guys. Bye.